I know what you think, and I know what the authority thinks. We're here today to talk about gender ideology. Being a penguin isn't a gender. The charges formed without set from the beginning, but any, I don't, anyway. I don't. Queer's gender. You try running with your sagging breasts down the middle of the fucking street. But I can't be a six foot five Chinese woman. No hate, no fear, every gender's welcome here! She. Uh, I don't, I just don't think they're women. <laughs> I'm not. And the often violently abusive behaviour of trans rights activists. You cut that out now, or you'll go home in an ambulance. That almost always gets ignored by celebrities, MPs, and other supporters of the ideology. At the risk of sounding like Adam Curtis, let's start our story by taking a quick look at the Lebanese Civil War widely agreed to be one of the most complex and multifaceted wars ever fought. You might not think this has any relevance to discussions or debates around gender, but we think there are some parallels to be found which we'll explain later, so bear with us as we give an overview of the conflict in less than three minutes. Lebanon is home to six million people, situated in the Middle East and made up of various ethnic groups. At the time civil war broke out, it was home to Maronite Christians, Shiite and Sunni Muslims, and the ethno-religious Druze. The country had a long history of warfare situated next to Israel, Syria and Palestine amongst other countries. The country was ruled by the right-wing Maronite Christian Phalanges or Khatib party, and the civil war began when they started fighting the left-wing Palestinian liberation organisation, the PLO, who was supported by both Muslim communities and the Druze. The PLO were in Lebanon expanding as an organisation, gathering support for their movement for a free Palestine and maintaining their armed struggle with Israel to the south. The Muslim-backed PLO were made up of several Palestinian groups, the largest of which was Fatah, previously known as the Palestinian National Liberation Movement, led by Yasser Arafat. Other members included groups so similarly titled that it would take 10 minutes just to name them all. The PLO received support from the Lebanese national movement made up of left-wing organisations from Lebanon and Syria, supported by the Druze. They also had allies from other countries including Armenia, Kurdistan, Iran and at one point even the Japanese Red Army. Opposing them, the right-wing Christian Khatib Party formed a Lebanese Front Coalition, backed by groups including the National Liberal Party, among others. The armed wings of these parties joined forces with the Marada Movement and Tigers Militia to form a coalition called the Lebanese Forces, not to be confused with the Lebanese Armed Forces, who were basically the Lebanese Army, who also fought in opposition to the PLO. Internationally, the PLO was of course allied with Palestine, but also had backing from Syria and Iran, while the Lebanese Front was supported by Israel. However, as the PLO essentially stands for Palestine in this war, and Iran Iran was going through its own revolution at the time, we're going to leave them out of the picture and concentrate on Syria's involvement. Initially on the side of the PLO and LNM, the Syrians soon fell out with them and decided to go it alone, opposing both the PLO and also the Lebanese front, and soon began attacking both sides. This led to international peacekeepers entering the country from the Arab Deterrent Force and the United Nations. The Lebanese armed forces were driven into the south, all its members defected to different sides and it pretty much disbanded. The peacekeepers left and Israeli troops were pushed into the south of the country. We'll pause the action there just to look a bit more in detail at the interfactional fights that occurred along the way. During the conflict, various factions defected, fought each other and were a pretty disharmonious collection of groups. The Kurdistan Workers' Party, or PKK, and the Japanese Red Army weren't really too involved. They were receiving training from the PLO at the time, so they basically left. When Syria backed out of the coalition, the Syrian Alliance groups also left. The Armenians, who were predominantly Christian, didn't really know what to do and ended up fighting on both sides, sometimes simultaneously. The Iranian Bakhtamal movement decided it hated everybody, including itself, split in two, and the Hezbollah group was created. Meanwhile, the Lebanese armed forces disbanded and were replaced by the South Lebanese army, who then went on to join Israeli troops fighting in the south. Syria drove the Israelis and SLA out of the country, defeated the PLO-LNM alliance and pretty much took over the country in 1991, ending the war. So there you have it, one of the most confusing civil wars filled with infighting, defections, external pressures and everything else condensed into three minutes. As we said earlier, the only reason we even mention Lebanon is that there are quite a few parallels with the gender ideology discussion. Now, we're obviously not stating that the gender ideology discussion is on the same level as such a deadly and destructive war, or equating either side's beliefs or politics to any specific ideology, position or otherwise, but we are making the comparison in terms of the factional shifts, changes, emergences and sheer complexity of the debate. If you can grasp the overall concepts of the Lebanese Civil War within three minutes, the gender ideology debate shouldn't prove too complex, right? Well, we'll see. In 
In recent history, the UK has been home to several political parties, on the left of the Labour Party and the Greens, toward the right of the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives, along with the far-right populist parties such as the BNP, EDL or National Front. The UK was uniquely positioned within the EU, but also very closely allied to the USA, until it recently left the EU for reasons no one really understands. The Church, historically at least, played a very large part in the UK's politics, and began to clash with the nascent gay rights movement in the 60s and 70s. Let's take a closer look at the political support for the gay rights movement in the UK. The gay rights movement was set up to seek equality for lesbians, gays and bisexuals, which became known more recently as the LGB community. This movement grew to include the transsexual community, people who physically transition from male to female or vice versa. It was supported by the Labour Party and to a lesser extent the Lib Dems, while the Conservative Party were in opposition to it, especially during the 1980s under the leadership of Margaret Thatcher. Also opposed were the church and the far-right groups such as the BNP, and more recently by elements of the alt-right. Meanwhile, the Green Party wasn't really involved because they were off looking at trees and being naked in fields. That has all changed in recent times, however, and the Conservatives and Greens, along with most of the country, rightly support LGB rights. In fact, the Conservative and Lib Dem coalition were the ones to legalise gay marriage, a decision that even saw the church reluctantly show their support. So, all was well, the people were happy, and only the far right had an issue. The battle had been won to a large extent and everything seemed stable. However, a new ideology wormed its way over and got involved. This came from America and was called Queer Theory. All you need to know for this video is that Queer Theory brought along identity politics and the concept of transgenderism, and all hell has broken loose ever since. Let's take a quick look at transgenderism. Under the umbrella of the term transgender or trans, there are many other groups of people who identify as non-binary, asexual, pangender, queer gender, and gender fluid. These are just the main most referenced groups, however, as trans includes an almost unlimited amount of gender identities within it, including neurogender, vapogender, and tetrasgender, which is honestly not a joke. There are far too many to include all of them here now. Queer theory has also opened up the term trans to crossdressers and drag artists, autogynophilic or AGP men, heterosexual men who are sexually aroused at the idea of having a female body. Queer theory takes this further by adding transhumanists into the mix too, including fairies, rubber pups, and other fetish communities, all under the umbrella of trans. Finally, people called intersex, or suffering from disorders of sexual development, have also been included under this banner, despite many of them not wanting to change their sex. This means that the previously sexuality-based LGB rights movement has now become the gender-based LGBTQIA movement, entirely due to queer theory and the transgender movement that grew in American social studies courses, spread online primarily through Tumblr, and is heavily supported by groups and people such as Susie Green and Mermaids, the gay rights campaigner Peter Tatchell, Ruth Hunt at Stonewall, Benjamin Cohen at Pink News, Owen Jones and others at The Guardian, and Ash Sarker and Aaron Bastani at Novara Media. So now the debate has shifted, it's no longer about gay, lesbian or bisexual rights, it's more of a political movement aligned with queer theory, which has become known as gender ideology. The gender ideology movement has looked to promote transgender rights online, using social media, and has seen the creation of the Trans Rights Activists, or TRAs. The very first thing these fundamental activists did was to bully the transsexual community out of their ideology, labelling them true scum for having undergone cross-sex surgery. Trans rights activists popularised the phrase trans women are women, changing the meaning from an initially figurative slogan designed to attract support for trans rights to a now literal belief that trans women are in fact biologically women. We'll look at this later on in our video. Needless to say, feminists weren't best pleased when they saw this autogynophilic men, men who were sexually aroused by the idea they have a female body, were now claiming access to women-only safe spaces, such as rape crisis shelters or communal changing rooms. Feminists and feminist groups opposing this were attacked by trans rights activists labelled TERFs or trans exclusionary radical feminists. Nothing perhaps demonstrates the move from a sexuality based movement to a gender based movement more than the splitting of feminist lesbians from the LGBTQIA movement, who joined with transsexuals and other allies to create the gender critical movement. A lot of this was in response to heterosexual autogynophilic men claiming to be lesbian women, despite not changing their sex in any other way than wearing women's clothing. The gender critical movement was attacked by very abusive trans rights activists and also anti-feminist groups such as the men's rights movement, along with other misogynistic trolls on media such as Reddit, 4chan and Twitter. At the same time, these trolls were also joined by the police, who received training from such gender ideology groups as Stonewall and Mermaids. 
In more recent times, large parts of the intersex community have left the LGBTQIA movement, unhappy that their disorders in sexual development are being appropriated and misrepresented to suggest there is a scientific basis for transgenderism. In fact, most of the scientific community is now squarely in the gender critical camp, as the denial of biology by the trans rights activists is pushed forward ever more frequently. Finally, the gender critical movement has seen a rise in detransitioners joining, many of whom have been almost excommunicated from the transgender community and received abuse rather than support from trans rights activists once they decided to revert back to their original gender. So, in summary, that's how the gender critical side began, as a pushback to the often violent and abusive trans rights activists. You transphobic piece of shit. So this is the protesters who have a right to protest but not to intimidate. They're kicking on the windows to stop the meeting. The police are doing nothing. They're just standing there and letting people kick the window. The police are doing nothing. The police are still doing nothing. So intimidation of women is continuing. The police are doing nothing. In, I'm getting fed up with this, you know. I've had things thrown at me. I've been accused of things I have never done or said. Uh, people seem to have no concern about evidence or uh, indeed um, even about libel. If a man is, has his gender reassigned and outwardly and he feels inwardly is a woman, in your view, can he be a woman or not? No. There are two genders, male and female. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're not lucky enough to be born into the right one, so you transition into the one that you suit Which seems the most. to me eminently sensible, and I have complete respect for people mm. that do that. It's not an easy process no. physically, psychologically, emotionally, or any of those things. Yeah. I salute you for your common sense. Now, let's bring you into this equation. Different. There are a hundred different genders on this BBC list, apparently, mm. right? One of them is two-spirit person, polygender, pangender, neutroids, Intergender. I have to say, do you know what they mean? I have no idea what they mean. Okay. There are a hundred genders they can identify as. You have come to defend it, and you don't know what half of these are. But hang on, Piers, ignorance isn't a defence. You're the ignorant one, and you're the one defending it. What this does is actually makes, I think, people who have transgendered, it makes them figures of fun, it exposes yeah. them to needless mockery, it makes the whole thing look ridiculous. You mock and actually, the real victims tend to be people who have transgendered and have to put up with this nonsense. How many sexualities do you think there are? Uh, oh, well, don't ask me to... <laughs> I think misogyny plays a really big part in all of this. Um, that a man who goes to these lengths will be a better woman than someone who was just born a woman. One of the most common misunderstandings of the gender ideology debate is the assertion that this is a left-wing versus right-wing argument, with the gender ideology on the left and the gender critical reaction on the right. But this is entirely wrong and shows a lazy and reductive thinking, as almost everybody involved in this debate, from women to trans women, lesbians, feminists and transsexuals, appear on both sides of the left-right divide. It's not a case of simply being left-wing versus right-wing. In fact, the political parties involved are pretty much all split on this issue, with various sub-factions being gender critical and others jumping full steam into the ideology. Even parts of the church and the far right have bought into this ideology, so the assertion that this is a left-wing versus right-wing debate just isn't true. So where exactly are the battle lines? To fully understand where the politics lie beneath the ideology, it's essential to look at the argument from an authoritarian versus liberal point of view, as well as left versus right wing. Gender ideology sits firmly on the authoritarian side of this argument, on both the left and the right wing. The gender critical reaction to this falls squarely on the liberal side. This is evident as most gender critical commentators believe that people should be able to dress or act how they please, as long as it doesn't clash with women's rights. And although the majority of the gender critical camp is politically left-wing, 
There are some on the right who hold similar views. This is the liberal right wing though, which tends to be more centrist in its views as opposed to the far right wing. It's an important distinction as most of the abuse transgender people face comes from the far right, supporters of groups like the EDL for example. This is where most of the vile, truly transphobic and homophobic abuse comes from, both online and in real life. However, instead of addressing this issue directly with the far right groups involved, the trans rights activists simply dish abuse directed at anyone on the gender critical liberal side of politics. It's a simple case of authoritarianism versus liberalism, and we've seen this play out time and time again in history. Gender ideology has its roots in university courses, primarily in America. It has at its very core a belief in totalitarian politics. This can clearly be seen in the trans activists doxing, shutting down women's groups and general support of cancel culture trying to get people fired from their jobs for disagreeing with the ideology. There are a great deal of subversions of reality and deceit embedded in the gender ideology movement with the belief that people can biologically change their sex at the heart of the ideology itself, rejecting scientific opinion. There's no authoritarian and violent rhetoric as we will outline in this video and calls for people to educate themselves on the ideology when people disagree with them. Add to that the silencing of any and all criticism and an anti-scientific belief system along with faith in a utopian future that can't be sustained, and you can clearly see the gender ideology mirroring previous ideologies, specifically Maoism, the communist ideology espoused by Mao Zedong in the 60s and 70s in China, which led to over 30 million deaths in Mao's cultural revolution. And you know who else agreed with Mao? Yasser Arafat and the PLO, who claimed that Maoist China was the biggest influence in supporting our revolution and strengthening its perseverance. Mao's quotes in the Little Red Book are made compulsory reading. With themes such as correcting mistaken ideas, the quotations become the standard by which all revolutionary efforts are judged. A youth organization called the Red Guards springs up throughout the country, preaching the teachings of Mao. The Red Guards travel all over the country, smashing the old culture, destroying much of the cultural heritage. They spearhead the interrogation, humiliation and beatings of teachers, intellectuals and traditional enemies of the state. 16 million young people are sent to the countryside for re-education and physical labor. Tens of thousands of officials are accused of being traitors, counter-revolutionaries and capitalist stooges. I actually Trans witnessed um, a, a girl um, throwing herself from a top um, upstairs window because she couldn't stand the, uh, the torment. I was 14 when the Cultural Revolution took place and there was a lot of violence and atrocities and I thought to myself if this is a paradise what then is hell? Even though I questioned the society I was living in, the regime, I couldn't question Mao the indoctrination, the brainwashing, made it so hard for one to break out of that indoctrination. Um, and without somebody spelling it out, I mean, even very intelligent people um, <clears throat> lived in a kind of cloud, in, um, in, with muddy, unclear, vague thought. Um, you know, my all-time literary um, hero is this child in Hans Christian Andersen's story, The Emperor's New Clothes. And this child had spelled it out, the emperor has no clothes. In 1968, the minister of Pakistan brought a gift of 40 mangoes to Chairman Mao. People of China had never eaten tropical fruit before, so this was a delicacy to them. Mao couldn't possibly eat 40 mangoes on his own, so he handed out the fruit to his political team, and a couple got in the hands of a group of factory workers. They were so mesmerized by this magical sweet fruit that they literally started to worship it, saying that it was a symbol of the wonderful new things that Chairman Mao would bring to their land. They placed it in a glass case, and when the fruit went bad, they replaced it 
with a wax replica. One man who had never tried mango before questioned why everyone was worshipping this piece of fruit. Well, then it got a little bit ridiculous, because even the mere suggestion that a mango wasn't a magical fruit was enough to kill a man for treason. This is just one of many examples of how irrationally devoted to Mao Zedong people were. He was willing to dismantle thousands of years of Chinese history and culture in order to execute his communist vision. We've mentioned autogynophilic or AGP men, and it's worth taking a moment to describe who they are, given they play quite a big role in pushing the gender ideology forward. Dr. Ray Blanchard from the University of Toronto coined the phrase autogynophilia in order to distinguish two types of transgender males that he observed in clinical practice. Traditionally, most people think of transgender people as homosexual transsexuals who transitioned due to ongoing gender dysphoria, displaying femininity from childhood. But, Blanchard observed, these are not the only males who may look to change their gender. There is a second group known as autogynophiles, or AGP men. Blanchard's studies show that AGP men are heterosexuals, men who typically enjoy traditionally male pursuits or have worked in very masculine occupations such as the military. These men are sexually aroused by both cross-dressing and the very idea of being a woman, fetishizing this notion. Blanchard suggested that there are four types of autogynophilia, which AGP males may have individually or in combination, all of them distinct from the homosexual transsexuals that most people may imagine when thinking of trans women. These include transvestic autogynophilia, an arousal to cross-dressing, behavioural autogynophilia, an arousal to the act or fantasy of doing something regarded feminine, behaving as women for sexual gratification, physiological autogynophilia, which is an arousal to fantasies of having the bodily functions of women, including becoming pregnant or having periods, and anatomic autogynophilia, arousal to the fantasy of having female anatomic features, deriving sexual pleasure from the idea of having female genitals, for example. What I had said uh, was that there are two etiologically different types of male to female transsexualism. They are similar only if they eventually present with a request for sex reassignment surgery, but where they're coming from was very different. And beyond that, I said one type was associated with ordinary homosexuality. You might think of them as like Kinsey nines. And um, the other type were associated with uh, an erotic erotic excitement at the idea of being or looking like a female. Something similar to the old concept of fetishistic transvestism, except I made it more general. It contradicted their notion of themselves. They really wanted to go with the woman trapped in a man's body, which often became lesbian trapped in a man's body. They wanted to go with that, and although I never ever said this type of transsexualism is nothing but a sexual fetish, that was how they read what I was saying. What I said was, this is the foundation, the basis. This particular erotic preference gets the ball rolling, but this type of sexual preference, which I called autogynophilia, can result in a gender identity inversion that has much broader ramifications. I know for a fact that many autogynophilic male to female transsexuals are not truthful about their history of sexual arousal with cross-dressing. You know this either because they've changed their story when you look at their clinical charts and they said something different five years ago from what they're saying now. Sometimes you know it because you get to talk to the wife and the wife gives a picture of what their sex life had been that's totally different from what the patient tells you. As I told you, the circumstances when I invented the word autogynophilia, I thought I was writing for maybe a few hundred people around the world. Right. I certainly did not invent the word as a term of reproach. Now I think a lot of trans activists are trying to sell it as a bad word. This is a word that should never be uttered in polite society or anywhere else. But that's the spin that they're trying to put on the word because they actually want to obliterate the concept from public awareness. They're not concerned about what word is applied. and. I think they're only secondarily concerned about what stigma is attached to it because they're basically the ones who are connecting it with stigma. I think they don't want the concept to exist. They don't want people to think about it. Let's take a step back to recap. 
Similar to the Lebanese Civil War, we can look at the factional infighting that has occurred along the way. The LGB movement had strong support from almost all political groups in the UK, with only a small minority of people opposed to rights for gays, lesbians, bisexuals and transsexuals. Then the transgender ideology came along, bringing with it identity politics and a huge amount of different, ever more specific gender identities. This included the furries, rubber pups, drag artists, crossdressers, and most problematically, autogynophilic men, turning it from a movement based on a person's sexuality to one based on a person's gender identity, changing the LGB to LGBTQIA+. Transsexuals were bullied out by this new community and transgender took over within the movement. The likes of Stonewall and Mermaid supported this move towards transgenderism and away from sexuality, and a trans rights activist sprung forth using Tumblr, Reddit and Twitter to harass, abuse and bully people into believing their ideology. The police were used by the trans rights activists groups to enforce their tactics after the police were pushed into the ideology by groups such as Stonewall and Mermaids. Left-wing media outlets like Pink News, The Guardian and Novara Media jumped at the chance to report on the gender ideology movement and away from the typical stories concerning gay and lesbian issues. Trolls and men's rights activists have used the transgender ideology as a screen from behind which they can bully and harass women. Seeing this, many lesbians have left the movement along with feminists, most of whom were or are Labour members, causing a huge split on this issue within the party. Many groups have been set up to fight for women's existing rights, such as A Woman's Place UK. And people with intersex conditions, many of whom were unhappy being dragged into the trans community to begin with, have disassociated themselves from the movement. More recently, a lot of gay men and bisexuals have also left, and the sexuality-based LGB alliance group, which also includes transsexuals, was created to give them support and fight for their rights, after the failings of Stonewall and the transgender movement became apparent. The scientific community, especially the fields of biology and evolutionary biology, have also begun to question or oppose the trans rights activists, as have former transgender people themselves. Politically, while half of the Labour Party, Lib Dems and Greens have thrown their weight behind the gender ideology movement, the Conservatives have decided to take a step back, listening to women's concerns. This has formed a very uneasy alliance with many on the gender critical side, who mostly hold very traditionally left-wing beliefs. There has been a shift within the gender ideology movement to view sexuality as somewhat harmful, unhealthy or outdated, all words which are direct recent quotes from trans activists and not conjecture. The movement is seeking to replace the terms lesbian, gay and bisexual with new terms including pangender, gender fluid or queer gender. This means that LGB people would no longer be part of their own LGB movement and instead the transgender ideology would be the de facto leaders of a movement that is heavily associated by the public with gay, lesbian and bisexual people. This increase in transgenderism has seen a huge rise in the power of abusive trans rights activists, many of whom are not transsexuals but heterosexuals and AGP men. I know this is confusing and it can be hard to see the wood for the trees, but let's simplify our illustration here. Firstly, let's assume that all of the 700 plus genders are included under the trans banner. Secondly, we can take political parties out of the equation too. Finally, let's take out the trolls, the social media platforms and other media being used. If we then tidy things up, it gives us a very clear distillation of the issues at hand. The transgender movements, led by abusive trans rights activists, autogynophilic men and supported by Stonewall mermaids and the police, aided by the men's rights movement, are all opposed to homosexual transsexuals, lesbians, gay men and bisexuals feminists and their allies, people who have detransitioned, intersex people, and the concept of science itself. It's the complete reversal of the entire LGB movement. It's gone from supporting LGB rights against oppression to support oppression of LGB, transsexual, intersex and women's rights. However, they still receive the funding, corporate sponsorship, media time and other things hard won by the LGB community over the decades. I think it's silly to have anything other than two genders. So. That, okay. Anything could you please, else is could a you please opinion. keep that opinion to your own house? Thank you. Not in this So school. you get to put your opinion out in class and my no, opinion I, has I to, am not my putting, opinion has to stay inside my house. I am not putting house. my opinion. I am not putting my opinion out. I am stating what is national school authority policy. Okay? Well, it's not scientific whatsoever. You don't have to kick me out of class. I'm and sorry. waste 30 minutes I'm, of my time. Or I could have been down revising doing something else. Instead, I state something I believe in. You kick me out of class for 30 minutes and okay. I'm waiting on. Take this somewhere else. You can make an official complaint. I'm Please not going to make an official complaint. Why not? I just think it's. I know what you think, and I know what the authority thinks. I know what the authority's point of view well, It's very clear, very clear that we make no discrimination on the grounds of 
videos. I wasn't making discrimination. I'm simply saying they're two genders, male and female. Yes. Anything I'm else is a personal identification. Uh, so please, can you tell me what a woman is? Uh, um. Well, I I know I'm a woman, and uh, uh, and I think we we do we we know uh, what what we are. So how how can you tell what a woman is? Well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just sort of trying to understand, you know, what you're getting at. I think, I think we know um, when we engage with each other, when you know, we know if we are a woman, right? And I, you know, I can yeah. tell you that I am, right? So, um, and and you know, we're not going to. What if a man wears a dress to work twice a week? Could he a woman? Um, I, not necessarily. But could he be? Well, I think. If you dress as a woman twice a week to go to work, do you count whose gender pay gap? Do you count as a woman for the gender pay or a man? Well, clearly, in terms of the gender pay gap, members of um, staff will uh, identify their gender in you know company records to HR typically, and the company will then produce the statistics accordingly. Anna, can I explain why this has become? A, a oh, talking yeah. point within the Liberal Democrat campaign. It's because you've promised complete reform of the Gender Recognition Act and effectively said you will remove the need for medical tests and feeds, that people, individuals will be able to self identify. And there is a significant body of women who feel that they will be deprived of safe spec spaces. Yes, obviously, we respect people and everyone has a right to express themselves and people's choice of partner, spouse, clothing should not be affected by their sex in any way. But under self-ID, what's to stop a male sex offender walking into the changing room and saying, do you know what, today I identify a woman as a woman. Should we be kind and let him? Um, so, I mean, in a sense... We have women's spaces as a safeguard from men, don't we? But can, can and I, the, yeah, of course. I was just going to say, so, like... Uh, if, we, if we're leaving up, up to women to have to police their own spaces, I mean, that's why it's, diff it's a difficult issue, isn't it? Conflicting rights. We have women's spaces as a safeguard for men because we know men murder women, men rape women, but we're upskirting just to become a crime. People put cameras in changing rooms. That's why we have these women's spaces. And the feelings of a small number of people do not in any way reduce the threat of men. So that's why we need to think and discuss and talk openly about this. And that's what I'm asking you. Whereas if we go straight for the reforms that you're suggesting and people like me are, are given a piece for even talking about this, saying, look, we're not, even if every single trans person in the world has, you know, is fantastic and wonderful and kind and brilliant, that does not reduce the threat from men in any way. And I suppose uh, the, the argument, if you like, is on what's the best way to provide that protection because because yeah, at the moment we're just making all women well, yeah, women's toilets have been turned to unisex toilets that's not a, that's not a, a solution but you've also said you want all schools to introduce gender neutral uniform does that apply to religious schools as well I, I just think yeah I, I mean you know a headscarf is not gender neutral but, oh, look, but if a girl wanted to turn up at a school without a headscarf but the school policy was all girls must wear a headscarf that would be problematic for you would it well I, I think I think children should have choices. But if you are saying or, or leaving it open for interpretation that a gay person cannot say I would not be attracted to a trans person without being transphobic, that's poking their, your nose into their life. I, again Stephen, I think it's the premise of the trope. You know, for a long time we've talked about the idea of people having types and everything else like that uh, and I think that uh, increasingly is becoming outdated that people look for something much different in a partner and somebody, somebody that they may wish to, to, to date or to form a stable relationship Are you with. saying people can't have a type of person they're attracted to without being described as being discriminatory? <laughs> no, I'm saying that I think that's an outdated concept. Well, having a type of person you're attracted to? Uh, yes. That's outdated? But can I put it to you, Seamus, that there may be quite a few people listening to this programme today who, who you lose when you say that it is outdated and therefore we should feel old-fashioned in some way if, if people are thinking that they've got a type of person that they're sexually attracted to. Is this not political correctness gone crazy? No, it, it, it's not, Stephen. We want to, to be for people to be able to develop healthy and stable relationships and to focus everything on uh, appearance and people's physical characteristics is not a healthy 
a part or, or association with that. Is it not part of human nature that people can't help who they're attracted to? You know, they're, they're either attracted to people or they're not. No? <clears throat> but when we characterise that down and, and boil it down to this idea of uh, types and focusing on, like I said, physical characteristics, uh, that is an, an unhealthy basis for a... Uh, soul basis for a relationship and, and again relates back to the fact so you just said it was unhealthy I think you're totally mischaracterising what I've said Stephen uh, which doesn't surprise me whatsoever but I think it's very clear I don't think there's any need to be disrespectful to me if you want if you want to come on and I, I would suggest you treat me with the same respect I'm treating you but do you ever think the L's and the G's and the B's go I have an idea the T's, you know, I, I think it's LGB sounds good. And then somebody else would go, somebody with a hat that looked like Carmen Miranda's, would go, no, I like LGBT. <laughs> and then the other person, you're going to get a lot of trouble for this segment. Gender ideology is very vocally supported by a number of celebrities, MPs, and other names within the UK, including Susie Green, Peter Tatchell, Ruth Hunt, Benjamin Cohen, Owen Jones, Ash Sarker and Aaron Bastani, as we previously mentioned, the QC, Julian Maugham, Joe Swinson, former leader of the Liberal Democrats, Labour MPs including Lisa Nandy, Rebecca Long-Bailey, Lloyd Russell Moyle, Dawn Butler and Nadia Whittam, the SNPs, Mary Black, Tory MPs, Elliot Coburn, Crispin Blunt and Justin Greening, celebrities such as Billy Bragg, Frankie Boyle, Josie Long, Michael Legg, Susie Ruffle, the gender activist Benjamin Butterworth, the author John Ronson, activist Paris Lees, Professor Alice Roberts, the actors Nicola Coughlin, Daniel Radcliffe, and Emma Watson, activist and model Munro Bergdorf, trans sports people such as Rachel McKinnon, and Fallon Fox. and perhaps the most strident trans right activist supporters, Jamila Jamil, and Amy Challoner, who has worked for both the Liberal Democrats and the Green Party, although left both parties under a cloud after it was revealed Challoner was taking political campaign advice from her father, David Challoner, who was arrested and jailed for the rape of a 10-year-old girl he held captive and tortured. All of these people are either trans rights activists themselves or are supporting the trans rights activists pushing forward the gender ideology. They are almost all very vocal on Twitter, blocking people who raise questions about the gender ideology, and in some cases looking themselves to denigrate or diminish the concerns of feminists and their allies, including gender critical transsexuals, which shows very clearly that this movement is not actually concerned with the rights of all trans people. Here are just some, just some of the comments posted on Twitter about JK Rowling. Rowling published a deeply personal and entirely reasonable essay in which she defended herself against accusations of transphobia. She pointed out that biological sex and gender are two distinct things, and that trans rights activists are violently abusive against feminists. Rowling also explicitly stated in her essay that she believed that trans-identified people are vulnerable, deserve protection, and wanted them to be safe. She said she felt empathy and solidarity with trans women who had been assaulted or abused by men, and used her own personal experience of facing domestic abuse to illustrate this point. This hasn't stopped a torrent of abuse directed at her from trans rights activists though, who have issued death threats, threats of rape, accusations of transphobia and bigotry, and claims of racism, white supremacy, and her wanting to kill all trans people, and a thousand other claims that evidentially aren't true in the slightest. It's one thing to disagree with her views on gender ideology, or want to explain any ignorance perceived in her essay, but it seemed that 
This wasn't the right course of action for trans rights activists, who went on to post pornographic images and other abusive comments in reply to her tweets about a children's drawing contest. This abuse has carried on for weeks and appears anytime Rowling posts anything on Twitter at all. And she's not the only one to have to endure this abuse. Trans rights activists have been posting similarly violent threats to anyone who questions any aspect of gender ideology, no matter how small, in what appears to be a deliberate attempt to dismiss, silence, gaslight, and generally bully people into remaining quiet on this issue. If you want to find examples and evidence of this abuse directed at other people, you'll easily find it, because it's everywhere on social media. Probably even in the YouTube comments below this video, posted by people who haven't even watched this far into the thing. It's honestly all over Twitter who just don't seem to care. One of the main problems with the supporters of gender ideology is that they almost entirely excuse this abuse from trans rights activists. If you put it in front of them, you usually see a very weak, of course I condemn all abuse reply which is spookily similar to Donald Trump's bad people on both sides line, or a but what about the abuse trans people get comment, which suggests that two wrongs somehow make a right. It's not enough for these celebrities and MPs to condemn abuse in general. Until we see the likes of Owen Jones or Jamila Jamil or pretty much anyone on this list specifically condemn the actions of violently abusive trans rights activists, we guess we just have to assume that they're not too fussed about it. In fact, some of the people listed here are active participants in this abuse. Not a single person listed here has called out any abuse from trans activists. Not one. They've barely even acknowledged it is an issue, and when they do they just seem to wave it away, saying, oh of course it's bad but what can we do? Well, why not try publicly saying it's wrong? Try standing up to trans activists and saying, while I agree with the movement, I don't agree with your tactics, your abuse or your violent rhetoric. Unless these celebrities and MPs are fully in support of this abuse and think it's all fair game and part of the good fight, then it shouldn't be too difficult for them to do that. They each have large platforms and could go a long way to taking the heat out of this discussion and frankly reducing the number of women being verbally abused online or harmed in real life. There's a term known as partialising. This is basically exploiting the disreputable attributes of one side of a conflict while ignoring or hiding the disreputable attributes of your own party. Here's an example from the Lebanese Civil War. The leader of the PLO, Yasser Arafat, was quoted as saying, Whoever stands by a just cause cannot possibly be called a terrorist. And, we totally and absolutely renounce all forms of terrorism. Sound familiar? At the time of making these quotes, members of the PLO were engaged in many terrorist atrocities, including blowing up buses, killing innocent women and children, and were actively involved in guerrilla warfare. Although they aren't terrorists or fighting in an armed conflict, this is what trans rights activists and their supporters do all the time. The partialization is exactly the same. They denigrate the behaviour of gender critical people as abusive or transphobic, ignoring the masses of violent abuse their own side dishes out. Wolf's girlfriend comes after me, desperately trying to get my camera from me. Wolf comes up and thumps me and runs away. Initially, some people thought I was being attacked by four trans activists, but this is actually feminist hero um, Helen Steele. I wasn't sure what was happening, except that this guy was trying to steal my camera and I was desperately trying to hold on to it. And Ponytail Man now turns on one of them, pushes her and, well, let's say he loses touch with his feminine side, assuming he thinks he has one. See him aggressively striding towards this small woman, showing her who's the man and forcing her to retreat. Meanwhile, on the right, you see his mate's body bent over as he's pulling with all his might to get my camera, which is still looped round my wrist while I'm trying to hold onto my property and stop him running away with it. Finally, he got my camera from me and he smashes it. Wanna see that again, even slower? I'll zoom in. So you can see the camera in his hand, zoom out, and you can see it hit the ground. And then Tara Wolf comes over and thumps me twice. Now, where is Ponytail? Here he is. It's a shame you can't see him punch me in the face. It wasn't a hard punch, and he kicked me a couple of times, and I somehow lost balance and ended up on the ground. 
And as I remember it, that was the only point that I felt scared that I might get badly hurt. But the three cowards ran off, helped by their mates, and here I am getting up. One seems to think he's in a mosh pit. His mate attacks Maria and then uh, his other mate comes in from the right side to grab her as well and she ends up on the floor. And you can see they're trying to hide their faces because they don't want the world to know that they're cowards. But we've got clear pictures of each one of them. Hey, help! Someone! I really... Okay, so, so who was it? Who was it then here? Look, Get anyone, dumb anyone in, because like we should. Both well, so you think it's okay for men to hit women? And you're shouting, you're shouting, who protects the purse? Police to protect the purse from male violence. Well, that wasn't, that wasn't a mum. I don't care. If you're a piece of shit, I'm happy for them to hit. I'm happy for them to hit. Really? Yeah, if they're a piece of shit. Uh, fuck. They landed on J.K. Rowling. Rowling. Woo! Oh, yes! So long, J.K. Rowling is a turf and I fucking hate her. Like the okay. Yeah, J.K. Rowling is one of those and also is totally cool with, with transphobic violence. Uh -huh. She was like, hell fucking yeah, I hate trans people. Oh my Do her god. Own credit? And also, she has all the resources she needs to be like educated. My mind is blown at this point. But point. like, when you look back on Harry Potter, it kind of makes sense. Because she, <laughs> she like wrote a slave race into those books. I mean, just recognize that she's a piece of shit. Harry Potter was from like before she was being a spiteful. A spiteful asshole. Like, yeah. <laughs> at, this point, at this point, she everything she says. <laughs> at this point, everything she says is just troll. She's just being a dick. Like, yeah, can I get away with today? Yeah. <laughs> it's just like evil cartoon villain shit. At this point. Yes, you'll have seen J.K. Rowling in the press a number of times over the past few months and surrounding this issue. Uh, the latest development is that she's returned an award that she was given last year. This was the Ripple of Hope honor by the Robert F. Kennedy uh, Foundation. Um, and what has happened is the president of, of that foundation, Kerry Kennedy, who is the daughter of Robert Kennedy, has said that J.K. Rowling uh, is effectively transphobic, has said that she's she's expressed views that diminish the identity of, of trans people. Uh, this is an absolutely shameful accusation. I have to say, I've never seen anyone more misrepresented, uh, generally speaking, than J.K. Rowling over the past couple of months. And if anyone's actually interested in what she genuinely believes, they can read J.K. Rowling's very sensitive and compassionate blog post that she published a couple of months ago and she outlined her concerns. And what she's saying is she's concerned about women's rights. She's worried that single sex spaces can be compromised if someone can simply identify as a woman. Um, and all of this is coming out of her experience as a victim of domestic abuse. And, and, and she believes that biological sex is a reality. These are all legitimate positions to hold. Not only that, they are the positions of most people in the country, but what's happening is yeah, she, a very to, small to, group... To be fair, Andrew, to be fair, I mean, she has really upset a lot of transgender people in this country who feel absolutely undermined by what she's said. Uh, I actually disagree with that. A lot of the support that's come out for Rowling has come from trans people themselves, and they don't like the fact uh, that uh, trans people are being smeared by this small group of very aggressive activists who, I'm afraid to say, have expressed extreme misogyny towards J.K. Rowling. I've seen a lot of the abuse that's gone on. A lot of it does come from a place of misogyny. Um, and as Blair White, the American trans writer, has, has pointed out, um, trans people are sick of it, and they don't, I, they don't like these attacks that are going on, particularly the, the misogynistic abuse and I think J.K. Rowling has been extremely courageous, standing up for her principles, refusing to be bullied, refusing to be silenced. And I think we should all take a leaf out of that book. And I, I don't like the fact that she's been misrepresented. And I think it's unfair. I always used to say, I'm a lesbian trapped in a man's body. The issue here is trans activists, not trans people. These supporters of trans rights activists are obviously not homophobic or men's rights supporters, so why do they believe they're in the right, especially as not a single one of them has actively made any effort to specifically denounce the abuse given out by trans rights activists? 
There may be a few reasons, but in general, it appears that trans rights activists and groups like Stonewall and Mermaids have been successful in pushing incorrect and misleading statistics that paint a very different story around transgender people than the evidence suggests is true. There are two main areas around which these statistics have been misrepresented. These are the rates of murder of trans people and suicide rates in young trans people denied surgery or hormone treatment, and both are used to paint UK transgender people as a very oppressed group. However, drilling down into these statistics shows a very different story indeed. Transgender murders are almost entirely localised to Brazil, Mexico and the United States, and around two thirds of victims were sex workers and were black. When looked at in comparison to murder rates in each country, the statistics show that murder rates of trans people are actually much lower than for people in those countries overall, at around one third the national average. In fact, in America, the numbers are trending downwards year by year, despite claims of an epidemic of murder pushed forward by trans rights activists. Looking further, it appears that the vast majority of those murders were associated with sex work, drugs or domestic violence, rather than any transphobic motives of the perpetrators. Bringing this back to the UK, there is no evidence at all that transgender people are being killed at any higher rate than the overall population. In fact, since the year 2000, less than 10 trans people have been murdered, including one case of a trans person murdered by another. Again, we see a pattern of domestic violence, drugs or sex work as the motives for these murders. In that same period, there have been 24 murders perpetrated by trans people. 23 by trans women and one by a trans man. The claim that trans people are being murdered every week or that there's a sudden transphobic murder spree taking place are just completely without evidence in the UK. It's interesting to look at the murder rates of women over the past 20 years too, as a comparison. In 2019 alone there were more than 240 female victims of homicide, the highest number since 2006, and these murder rates are rising year on year. The other area misrepresented by trans activists is suicide rates in young trans people denied surgery or hormone treatment, with some truly terrifying statistics appearing in the press from trans rights activists and their supporters, often mentioned to justify or excuse their misogynistic or abusive behaviour. Gender dysphoria sufferers, according to trans rights activists and groups like Mermaids and Stonewall, are committing suicide in extremely high numbers, and social and medical transition, including irreversible surgery on children, is the only way to prevent this fate. According to Mermaids, Stonewall and others, some 48% of young trans people have attempted to commit suicide. As emotionally strong as this claim may be, again there isn't much evidence to support this number, nor the fact that affirmation and social and medical transition is the only solution to gender dysphoria in children. In actual fact, the reverse may be true. Fair Play for Women, a group led by Dr Nicola Williams, looked into UK studies conducted by Stonewall and Pace, another LGBT charitable organisation, and found fundamental weaknesses in these studies which seriously undermine the claims of these groups. We won't go into all of the details here, but we will leave a link to their findings in the description below. They found that the figure of 48% of young trans people attempting to commit suicide came from a survey from Pace. Dr Williams discovered that only 120 transgender people were questioned, of which only 27 respondents were under the age of 26 years old. Of these 27 young trans people, 13 reported having attempted suicide at some point in the past. As well as a number of issues around the way the survey was carried out and analysed, Dr Williams has pointed out some major flaws in using this data to justify the trans rights activists' claims. Firstly, and most obviously, a sample size of 27 people is not sufficiently large enough to give any real evidence on this issue. Also, the study did not ascertain when these suicide attempts took place, either before or after medical transition, so don't accurately reflect the true suicide risk if trans children are not supported to transition. Mermaids, the charity group supporting medical and social transition of young people, are also claimed to have used these statistics in a very misleading way, stating that the 48% figure comes from a survey of over 2,000 trans people, rather than a survey of 2,000 LGBT people, of whom a total of only 27 identified as trans. Obviously, suicide is a very tragic thing, but exaggerating the risks and constantly using the threat of suicide to emotionally blackmail people makes the gender ideology movement look very disingenuous, and is actually very irresponsible, as parents who think their child is suicidal may treat them differently and make different decisions based on that information. Young people have a very high rate of suicide attempts in general when compared to the overall population, and gay, lesbian and bisexual young people who do not identify as trans also have incredibly high suicide attempt rates. 
Dr Williams' findings were also confirmed by the UK independent fact-checking charity Full Fact, who stated that they can't say how representative this is of the young trans community in Britain as a whole, as the overall sample was not adjusted to try and be representative. Further than this, the Tavistock and Portman Gender Identity Development Service states that among children referred to their clinic, suicide is extremely rare. Dr Polly Carmichael, Director and Consultant Clinical Psychologist at the Tavistock Clinic, stated that the PACE survey is deeply flawed and that rates of self-harm, distress and suicidal ideation are similar to children and young people's mental health service figures overall. None of this is to say that suicide rates among young people or young gay, lesbian, bisexual and trans identifying people aren't crazily high. They are and this is a huge problem. What we are saying is that using misleading statistics around suicide rates to promote gender transition in children is problematic at best, underhanded and immoral at worst. Just as a side note here, it seems that mermaids are slowly but surely being found out at the moment for pushing these misleading stats and promoting the transition of children and young people. In the course of writing and creating this video, they've been dropped by the BBC from their trans information pages. I have heard activists say that we have to allow children to medically transition to prevent them from killing themselves. I hear this a lot. It's one of the most powerful arguments that trans activists make, and it's very compelling. No parent wants to be responsible for the death of their child, especially by suicide. This is such an incredibly profound case of emotional blackmail. And I just want to point something out to people, that if you have a child who is so emotionally distressed that they're threatening suicide, that child needs to belong in a behavior unit. That child needs intensive mental health services. That child is not emotionally capable of making big decisions about their life. And that child is not in a position to make long-term decisions about their health and well-being. Now, there are lots of cases where a child might threaten suicide. But here we have children who are saying they're going to kill themselves if they don't get harmful drugs and the parents and the doctors acquiesce. They say we have to give them these drugs or else they're gonna kill themselves. It reminds me a little bit of anorexics. If an anorexic threatened to kill herself if doctors didn't give her liposuction, the doctors wouldn't give her liposuction, her parents wouldn't give her liposuction, and teachers wouldn't encourage her to pursue liposuction, no. We would get that child help quickly because we'd know that there was a problem, that that child felt so uncomfortable in her body that she wanted to kill herself if she couldn't change it. And that's what gender identity disorder, gender dysphoria, a trans identity is all about. It's about being so uncomfortable in your body that you want to change it. So we have children who are experiencing this extreme distress with their body and who are threatening suicide. And we're saying, yes, we should give them drugs. We should give them what they want. We should give them what they ask for. This is so irresponsible on so many levels. It's medical malpractice, and it's horrifying that trans activists are telling parents that it's better to have a transgender child than a dead child. They're telling parents that their children are going to kill themselves if they're not allowed to transition. So basically they're admitting that these children have serious mental health issues. We're giving them drugs that are going to damage their bodies for the rest of their lives. Arguments invoking harm to children tend to stick in people's minds. That's because they prey on our maternal or paternal instincts. We want to protect children and young adults from harm. The gender ideology movement uses them all the time. This is known as pedophrasty. The use of children in an argument to prop up a rationalisation, silent opponents and suspend judgement or critical thinking. This isn't just the same as using children's experiences to make a point, it's the fact that the points are either disingenuous, incorrect, misrepresented or outright lies that makes pedophrasty a distinctly separate concept. For the most famous example of this, we can travel back to 1990, when the Lebanese civil war was ending and Saddam Hussein's influence in Kuwait was growing. This is Naira, a 15 year old girl giving testimony to the US Congress, claiming horrific atrocities by Iraqi soldiers in a very emotional statement. Our final witness is 
also using an assumed name. And again, we ask uh, our friends in the media to respect the need to, for her to protect her family. And we finally call on Naira to testify. My mother and I were in Kuwait on August 2nd for a peaceful summer holiday. My older sister had a baby on July 29th, and we wanted to spend some time in Kuwait with her. I only pray that none of my 10th grade classmates had a summer vacation like I did. I may have wished sometime that I could be an adult, that I could grow up quickly. What I saw happen to the children of Kuwait and to my country has changed my life forever. It has changed the life of all Kuwaitis, young and old. We are children no more. It's the second week after an invasion, I volunteered, volunteered at the al Hospital with 12 other women who wanted to help as well. I was the youngest volunteer. The other women were from 20 to 30 years old. While I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators, took the incubators, and left the children to die on the cold floor. It was horrifying. If an Iraqi soldier is found dead in a neighborhood, they burned to the ground all the houses in the general vicinity and would not let firefighters come until the, until the only ash and rebel was left. I'm glad I'm 15 old enough to remember Kuwait before Saddam Hussein destroyed it, and young enough to rebuild it. Thank you. Nobody listening to this testimony can fail to be moved by the story, and indeed the US decided that this was enough to enter into the Gulf War. Naira's testimony is cited as the tipping point for that decision. The problem is, it was a hoax. It was all fake. Naira was the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador to the US. She was coached by a team of solicitors to put on such an emotional display. None of the stories she told were true. But the consequences of America entering the Gulf War, based on this testimony, have been long-lasting and devastating, leading indirectly to the 9-11 attacks. By the time it came out that this was a hoax, it was much too late to reverse the decision to go to war. Though obviously we're not equating warfare to issues around gender ideology, there are parallels to be found. The misleading use of statistics around suicide in young people to promote gender transition in children can also lead to irreversible decisions that aren't in the best interest of anybody. Giving children puberty blockers or removing healthy breast tissue or genitalia is irreversible. Once you go down that route, there's no coming back. And wouldn't any young person or parent want to know the full, accurate facts before making that decision? Where the gay rights movement was simply asking for acceptance of LGB people, the trans rights movement is seeking to go much further, defending irreversible medical changes to young boys and girls for the use of puberty blockers such as Lupron, which, in a grimly ironic twist, was the drug used to chemically castrate homosexuals, such as Alan Turing, in the 1950s. Gender ideology is causing massive harm through promoting social and medical transition as the only cure for gender dysphoria. While no one is disputing that gender dysphoria is real and can be very distressing to people, there seems to be such a high rise in the numbers of young women and girls being referred to gender identity clinics that simply putting it down to gender or body dysphoria seems reductive and inaccurate. The Tavistock, England's only gender clinic, saw a rise of 4,500% in girls being referred over the period from 2008 to 2018, with some girls as young as 4 years old being referred to the clinic. And it's worth investigating some of the reasons behind these skyrocketing referral rates, as the data around this shows some significant and shocking trends. Almost two-thirds of the girls referred to the clinic had one or more diagnoses of a psychiatric disorder or neurodevelopmental disability before announcing they wanted to transition, for example. The data also shows that half of those referred had undergone a traumatic event, such as bullying and physical or sexual abuse. In 2018, according to the Tavistock Clinic, more than 800 girls were given puberty blocking injections, including some girls as young as 10 years old. This is irreversible and can lead to lifelong side effects such as infertility, osteoporosis and sexual dysfunction. 
Lisa Littman, a doctrine researcher at Brown University in the US, describes the condition experienced by these girls as rapid onset gender dysphoria, or ROGD. It develops during or soon after puberty and mainly affects girls with no previous signs of childhood gender dysphoria. According to a study Dr. Littman produced, parents say that many girls do have a history of mental illness, and some are on the autism spectrum. She also claims that ROGD spreads via social and peer contagion in a similar fashion to self-harming, anorexia and bulimia. Compared to the incidence of gender dysphoria in the general population, which is less than 1%, Lippmann found that it was common to see two or more girls in the same friendship group begin to identify as transgender, her research notes claiming that online content may encourage vulnerable individuals to believe that non-specific symptoms and vague feelings should be interpreted as gender dysphoria stemming from a transgender condition. And this is borne out by evidence elsewhere. It was reported in 2018 that 17 pupils at one single school in the UK were transgender. Ray Blanchard, professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto, who spent many years working in a gender identity clinic and was the first to highlight the distinction between transsexuals and autogynophilic men, said the idea that social influences may be involved flies in the face of the born that way or you are who you say you are narrative and perhaps calls for a different approach with regard to best clinical practice. The most worrying finding in Littman's study, however, was that many of the cases of gender dysphoria experienced by these girls resolved itself within a couple of years. Unfortunately, it seems that most of the clinicians at the Tavistock have not looked at any of the wider issues around the mental health, history of trauma, or other alternative causes for gender dysphoria from which these girls may have suffered, and many were offered prescriptions for puberty blockers or hormones during their first visit to the clinic. So a lack of understanding or unwillingness to understand the deeper issues surrounding these girls has led to irreversible changes to their bodies, from blocking puberty to the removal of healthy breast tissue, as well as the longer term medical issues they may face. This has resulted in the Tavistock and Portman NHS Trust being sued by women and parents of girls who have been through this process, most notably Kira Bell, who says that the clinic should have challenged her more over her decision to transition. Bell was put on the pathway to transition at the age of just 16, given puberty blockers after just three hour-long appointments with the clinic. She was given testosterone, underwent breast removal, and developed facial hair and a deeper voice. Bell has now detransitioned, accepting herself as a woman, but has to live with the decisions made at a young age that were not challenged by the clinic. At 16, she went to the Tavistock Centre to talk about gender reassignment, and after three sessions, without her parents' consent, Kira started receiving treatment to become a boy. There was no real investigation into um, the other mental health issues that I was going through or any other factors that could possibly be contributing to the feelings that I had at the time. I think depression kind of kicked in a bit more because I, I was without any hormones in my body and, you know, especially at such a young age when it's supposed to be, you know, at its peak almost. That's, um, yeah, very detrimental, I think. Kira says the treatment she received left her feeling suicidal. She's now transitioning back and taking the Tavistock Centre to court. You have to live with the, the physical changes that you've experienced, um, especially when it comes to things like surgery. Um, but the, the whole process is really, really traumatic, really, when, when I'm looking back on it. And um, it, it's, it's, you, there's no going back from it, really, because, um, you know, you are changed forever visibly. More and more children are coming here for transgender treatment on the NHS. In 2018, two and a half thousand were referred here, but former staff members have already told us that they fear children who come here may be being overdiagnosed. At the Tavistock Centre, children can discuss treatment separately from their parents, and around half are put on hormone blockers to pause puberty. Sky News previously discovered that 35 clinicians from their gender identity service resigned in three years. I went down a pathway that I was very rigid in my thinking and now it's affecting me for the rest of my life. There are no easy answers here. Gender reassignment is complicated. It's been a difficult decision for Kira to share her story, a very personal battle that will now be played out in court. Bell is not the only detransitioner. The number of girls wanting to detransition is growing according to some reports, although there is a lack of data on this subject. Just to make it abundantly clear, although we're using children's experiences to illustrate our points here, these are facts, with evidence shown to back them up. 
Pedophistry is a distinctly separate concept that promotes fiction and one that we're not engaging in, just in case anyone thinks we're being hypocritical here. There's no question that the Tavistock and Portman Gender Identity Development Service has questions to answer around their clinical advice to teenage girls, but the spotlight should also focus on another group, the transgender charity Mermaids. Mermaids, led by Susie Green, have been very vocal in their lobbying of the public and clinical practices in the UK. This includes the Tavistock, where their involvement prompted the resignation of 35 staff members over a three-year period. One of them remarked that this experimental treatment is being done not only on children, but very vulnerable children who have experienced mental health difficulties, abuse or family trauma, but sometimes those other factors just get whitewashed. Mermaids have also been accused of bigoteering at the clinic, putting pressure on the service to place young people on medical transition pathways for fear of being deemed transphobic, even if this goes against their better judgement. Susie Green and Mermaids campaigned to actively push for the time limits around medical transitioning and puberty blockers being given to young people to be reduced, claiming that such intervention needs to be fast in order to be life-changing and life-saving. Green and the organisation have often used a 48% suicide rate figure to justify their position, despite, as we've pointed out, this figure coming from a study of just 27 self-selected young trans people, of whom 13 reported having attempted suicide. Mermaids have also been accused of misrepresenting this study. There's no question at all that some young people will and do suffer from gender dysphoria, and in some cases a medical transition approach may be the best option for them. That's not what we or anyone else is disputing here. We're simply pointing out that the evidence appears to suggest that this isn't the case for everyone, and that it certainly doesn't appear to be the cure-all that Mermaid states it is. But Mermaids are supported very vocally by trans rights activists and their supporters, with people like Owen Jones, Prince Harry, and others all lending their support to the charity, who also receive lottery funding. And despite their campaigning and Green herself appearing in the media quite often to promote their charity, it appears they are unwilling to answer questions about their methods or motives. The filmmaker Ollie Lambert, who reached out to Mermaids for a documentary he was producing in 2018, said that Mermaids work hard to shut down any debate rather than enter into it and win support and that during documentaries he had filmed on the Arab-Israeli conflict for the BBC, he found it was easier to get an interview with Hamas and the IDF than it was with Susie Green. Trans rights activists and their supporters have been incredibly quick to launch attacks on any reports of ROGD, claiming that it doesn't exist, that Dr Littman's research was flawed and that increased rates of referral are being seen because being transgender is now more acceptable in society, which may be a good point, except if this was truly the case, the numbers of people wanting to change their gender would be more even across all age ranges, both male and female, rather than specifically teenage or younger girls. Anyone questioning this is almost immediately met with bigoteering attacks from trans rights activists, who will claim these questions amount to transphobia. Graham Linehan being one example of this, who was constantly and consistently targeted by trans rights activists for questioning mermaids and the Tavistock. You've been vilified mm -hmm. on social media and that you've even lost work as a result of speaking out in this trans debate. Uh, there's protests, they get shut down. Um, uh, Kathleen Stock had a freedom of information request about her emails, you know? It, it's insane the abuse and harassment they face. Um, children are uh, basically being experimented on with uh, uh, puberty blockers. Lupron, which is which is um, a drug that's supposed to be meant for end-stage cancer treatment, uh, prostate cancer treatment, is being given to okay. young girls. These... It has never been tested on girls. It has never been tested on women. If you look at the Tavistock, 35 psychologists have quit the Tavistock in three years. Does that sound... That's one of, that's one of the centres uh, which deals specifically with um, people yes. who think that they want to um, change their gender. Yes, that's 35 over three years. Do you think that sounds like a healthy environment for children? 
I have no idea what the reason why people might be leaving are, but I know that the, the children I've being able other, to come I've, forward I've spoken and to talk other about issues that they feel, uh, it's entirely up to them whether or not they want to do that. Nobody's forcing anybody into No, no, into I'm sorry. Here. You don't tell children that they were born in the wrong body because they're children and they will believe you. That's the important... These are... I've seen kids... Uh, there are reports from the Tavistock that children as young as four were brought in. These are children... You know, children as, as are still believing in Santa when they're ten. You know, it's ridiculous, it's absurd. One of the other things that Tavistock whistleblowers reported was that homophobic parents were bringing in their gender non-conforming kids and telling them to fix them, you know? There was a dark joke that went around the Tavistock where they said that in, in a couple of years there'll be no gay people left, you know? Now that's why I compare it to eugenics programs and things like that. It, it, it is extremely serious. It's ex And all I'm asking for, all I'm asking for is that people like me and the women that I support are not attacked their meetings aren't protested. They aren't abused on Twitter. I've been sued. Yeah, okay. I've been I've been reported to the police. I know you. Have my you, wife you, you, my wife's address has been published online. And All these you, things have happened that because I'm trying to make the conversation the trans less toxic. To Trans activists this, threaten the feminists I support with rape and death threats, okay? So, so the idea that there's an equivalence between these two, I am absolutely happy to step out of this conversation completely once women like D uh, Kathleen Stock and Jane Claire Jones are allowed to speak. quite a lot of women think that they can speak for themselves, thank you, and they don't necessarily need Graham well, Linehan to come in and talk for well, us. Well, the women I support uh, are, value my support and are glad that I'm amplifying their voices. This is a hinge moment in history. We ask ourselves, what would I have done? Would I have bowed down? Would, have, would I have done, done everything I was told to do? Or would, have I, would I have resisted? Would I have stood up and would I have stood up alongside people who were trying to do the right thing? That's what I'm trying to do at the moment. And it's being made very, very difficult. Look, you know, two years ago, we wrote to Stonewall and we said, could we please bring down the toxicity of this conversation? Could we, could we, uh, please just look at some of these issues, some of these points where women's rights conflict with trans rights, and just talk about it. And within the day, Stonewall said no. They said they, absolutely they, not. So they said to us today, we invited them to come on the programme, and instead they gave us a statement saying trans, pe trans people in Britain face huge levels of abuse in all areas of their life. They quote statistics uh, showing that hate crimes against trans people have increased 37% in the last year, and say they're proud of their work towards trans equality. Yes, but the reason hate crimes have increased is because everything is now transphobic, including saying statements like, men aren't women. These are considered transphobic statements. So, so, so the reason that these hate crime figures are going up is because the bar has been set so low for what is and isn't transphobic. There has to be a conversation about this. It is absolutely crucial. The trans rights activists do not use evidence in their attacks though and appear to have no accurate facts to back up their assertions that young trans people will commit suicide unless they transition. They've also attacked detransitioners like Kira Bell, claiming that they weren't truly trans to begin with, which, illogically, is precisely the point that Bell is making. And they all stick to the line that trans women are women, and that there should be no debate or discussion around this. Well, it's estimated that around 48 children a week are now being referred to the Tavistock and Portman Trust, which is the NHS's first transgender clinic specifically for children. Well, a mother of a 15-year-old girl with autism is now taking legal action against the clinic to try to stop them giving her daughter hormone blockers after claiming the centre misinformed families and rush into treatment without proper assessment. Well, former Tavistock therapist Sue Evans is now speaking out about this. When I was there, there were about 100 children a year referred, whereas right. now there's about 2,000. There were certain clinicians who would refer children after maybe four or five meetings. And I found that to be shocking. I didn't think it was enough to send a child off for hormone treatment at, at such a young age mm -hmm. with so little investigation into really what was going on in their, what their age? life. What age are you talking about? There are children as young as 11 or 12 who might be offered these blockers. People being treat, uh, threatened with legal action by the mother of a patient aged 15 who has autism over its use of experimental treatments for children as young as 11. So the case argues that hormone blocking treatments are being unlawfully administered to children who cannot properly consent. What I know from clinicians who've less, left the service recently that I've been in touch with, and they were the people who blew the whistle anonymously is that they said that sometimes children were uh, referred to the clinic for hormones the informed consent is a form that they go through with the children but the problem is it's an experimental 
drug, it's used off licence, which means it was licensed for some other condition, precocious puberty, but now they're giving it to children with gender dysphoria. And many parents are really concerned about it because we don't think children of 11 or 12 understand the ramifications of signing up to something we... so early in their lives. And also there's a sort of political pressure which is taking children much quicker towards a one solution. And I, I want to sort of say that I'm not about saying this should never be the treatment for children. Um, I believe there are a small minority of children who ultimately for them, this is the answer. Mm -hmm. You know, this is going to help them. But I think children, when they come as adolescents, it's a difficult time. There's massive psychological change going on. The, the evidence base for the current treatment just isn't there and it needs to change. You said earlier that an 11 year old may not understand um, the side effects uh, of going through with this treatment. Um, what, what are you suggesting those side effects are? I've spoken with endocrinologists and they say there's in later life risk of cardiac disease, of stroke. There's certainly, if people have surgery, sexual dysfunction. Children are given uh, blockers in Tanner stage two, which is early puberty, which could be these children of 11 or 12. And then they progress through to the cross-sex hormones, which at the moment, according to the, the JIDS service, they, they are um, nearly 100% doing so. You, you are effectively sterilising the child because they won't be able to produce either sperm or eggs. Mm -hmm. Bob with us, this is a, quite an extraordinary number of children and this teacher thinks that uh, a number of them are autistic and that somehow might be having an influence on their decision. Is there a connection? Um, about 35% of the people who attend the Tavistock Child Clinic are autistic. Which the is the only clinic which deals with uh, Yeah, so there's children. a disproportionately high number. I think it's maybe about 1% in the general population. I might not be sure of that, but um, just say why I'm concerned, if you don't mind, because the very first person that I saw um, 25 years ago was somebody who'd been living as a woman for nine years mm -hmm. and had fully transitioned and then came to realise that it was a big mistake, at which point, of course, I'm sorry, it's breakfast television, but he'd lost his penis and he, it was really a deep tragedy for him. He was very suicidal, very depressed, and he got into psychoanalysis with me and recovered, mm -hmm. but he really wished that uh, he'd had psychoanalysis before he'd surgically transitioned. And in a way, that's why I'm so passionate about this. India. Of the referrals to the, uh, the, the Tavistock clinic we were talking about, right? Mm. Two were four years old, 13 were five years old, oh my goodness. 30 were six years old. Mm. Again, how can this possibly be right? I've had four kids. They don't know what the hell they're bloody choosing for breakfast, let alone what sex they want to be. How can this be right that we're referring kids of this age for potential surgery to change their sex? Well, again, this is all wrong because nobody gets referred for surgery at that age. What? The fact is that nearly 100% of the people who get put on puberty blockers go on to full well, medical not, transition. That's not actually true. Can I just mention the fact that we have something called the World Health Organization? There's a consensus of opinion mm. here. Um, well, About prior, what? prior to puberty, because what, if, what's if the consensus about? The consensus is the treatment of people who... Yeah, but I'm, all I'm saying yeah. is that the Tavistock Clinic says 95% of people who go on puberty blockers go on to full medical transition. A study by De Vries in 2011... Yeah, but we can play statistical tennis. No, it's I've not. Got as many OK, well, let's forget the statistics. Cures. How are we going to prevent but, unnecessary transitions with regrets? I, can we agree? Can we agree that if anybody transitions and ends up regretting it, they will have lost their fertility, they may regret no. it, their sex life is very likely to be seriously impaired? But you're looking through from the perspective of somebody who wants to keep the, the, the anatomy that would do that. Transgender well, people in my situation... Don't want okay, to India, keep you, it. I we mean, embrace think, losing it. Can we but protect I think these children? That's I what I'm saying. Of course we're protecting the, this them. Everyone's the looking after it. It's about children. Of course. And as we all know, children haven't made their minds up about very much at all and they're exploring their identity. And, and, it's and what people are concerned valid. about is that something might be put in place yes. that they may regret, may change their minds about, may not really know about, may be influenced. You know, this report referred to people being influenced by YouTube stars. Yeah. Ruby began identifying as male at 13 years old. Now, 21, she'd been planning to have surgery to remove her breasts. 
but in May she made the decision to come off testosterone and detransition to identify as female, her sex at birth. She doesn't want to be identified, so we've changed her name. I figured it would be better for me to try to deal with my gender dysphoria in a different way rather than um, permanently changing my body. How much support did you feel was out there for you when you came to this conclusion? I didn't feel like there was any support out there other than like a few friends online. Ruby now feels her eating disorder was more of a factor than she first realised in her gender dysphoria. None of the therapists that I spoke to um, brought that up. They didn't think that it was linked. Do you? I think so, yes, because it, they're both kind of based in how I feel about my body, so I've seen similarities between the two. Charlie Evans is forming a charity to support people in Ruby's position. After going public with her detransition story, she discovered an online community of 5,000 in a similar position, 30 people alone in her area of Newcastle. I was approached by a young woman um, with a beard and she hugged me and, and said, I'm a detransitioned woman as well, I've just stopped taking testosterone. Um, and after that I felt like I had to do something. I'm hearing from like, hundreds of people um, and I think some of the common characteristics are they tend to be around their mid-twenties, um, they're mostly female and mostly same-sex attracted, most are lesbians um, and often autistic as well. This idea that it is easy is in complete contrast to the experiences we hear every single day. You know, the, the process is rigorous and the process is there to ensure that any decision made is the right one for that person. We mustn't use these experiences to suggest that everybody is being dealt with in a way that suggests they're being pressured or made into being trans. That's incorrect. You can't make someone be trans. Anna Hutchinson says it's unquestionable that they need support. The burden of treatment for people who are trans identified is very significant. Even for those for whom it works, it might involve foregoing fertility, it will certainly involve, uh, or usually involves reliance on medication for the whole of your life and often surgery. Now, some people are more than happy to live with that burden of treatment because it works for them. However, there are a group for whom it won't work and that creates a situation where there's almost a double burden that they have to live with all of those changes that they've undergone and it still hasn't helped alleviate their distress. What's really, really important is to ensure that this experience isn't used to pressure other people. It shouldn't be used to, to tell those who are trans, those who are gender diverse, that they're wrong or different. It's about creating a system that makes everybody feel validated. Well, Dr Elizabeth Van Horn is a consultant psychiatrist in gender identity services at the Tavistock and Portman NHS Foundation Trust. What we know from our population is that actually well less than 1% of our population choose to detransition. Isn't, isn't that the point? That we don't know that number is small because we don't know the number. Many that we talked to just said they can't return to the Tavistock for whatever reason that is. And your duty of care, presumably, should be to find out how people are feeling, to find out what has happened afterwards, where there isn't the extensive medical research or evidence to take care of those people. I, I wouldn't disagree with you at all. And I would actually um, encourage anybody who's in that situation to go and see their GP and to seek to get a referral back to a gender identity but it's not just about so, going back, is it? It is, it is a concern that you're putting people on these pathways without enough evidence of the treatment or of the long-term consequences of what that treatment is doing. This, this can be life-changing treatment in many situations and circumstances. And that pathway is something that you're putting people on without the requisite evidence. Well, I, I accept that we can always have a better evidence base 
I don't accept that there is no evidence base. I think it depends on how you define your evidence base. I'm just curious because the, the NHS is meant to be dispassionate, isn't it? It is, it is for, for people to have faith in all treatments, whether it is a, a, a disease, a cancer, an asthma, or a gender reassignment, it has to be peer reviewed. It has to be evidence-based research. It's not enough to say we fail to be clinically curious or, or, or acquire the relevant data and evidence that we need to make sure this is well, right. I think that's both harsh and inaccurate actually. I mean I think a lot of research has gone on over the years. I think that it's quite difficult to do very long-term research in any field and if you're looking at people's reactions to transitioning and you're looking at what happens 5, 10, 15, 20 years very few studies will ever be set up that will actually take that into account. Well, if you look at the av hang on, let me just ask if, you about the numbers, okay? Because the numbers are astonishing that we know that in the last four years, the number of adults and children being referred to, to gender identity clinics has more than doubled. It's now at 8,000. Now, what do you attribute that to? I don't know. I, I don't think any of us know. But why aren't you finding out? I mean, you well, I'm can't not just say, I, I don't know, and, and we're not looking into it. I, I didn't say that. I said we don't know. Well, are you looking into and it? And we probably won't know until some time has passed. But we are faced in a day-to-day... -day are you looking into it? A really are, simple can question. I just, please. Are you looking we into it? We are faced in a day-to-day -day situation with extremely distressed people coming to us and we are trying to give them the best health care that we can. Of course, and, and when you have people coming through your door, you need to have the research to understand why. So, so are you looking into it? Can you explain, for example, why more than 75% of those refer to you are assigned female at birth? Do you, do you know that? No, not yet. We don't. No. So, so in that gap equally, between not knowing and not doing the research... And equally, Emily, prior to that, we didn't know why the majority of pe people that were being referred to our service were assigned male at birth. So if you do not understand the cause, how can you direct people on the right path when this could be a life-changing moment? I mean, is it enough to say, we don't know, and actually there is no body of research I can point to that is investigating this, we're just, we're dealing with whoever comes in the door. It, it, it's, it's not enough. When, when you hear gender dysphoria can often be part, or sometimes be part, of a complex web of issues, isn't it really important how you untangle those issues so that you don't actually say, oh, it, it, we can't start looking at quantitative results, we can't start looking at numbers. These are numbers that, that you have to look at because they... I'm not saying how from, you... Hang on, I'm not saying for a moment that we're not going to look at quantitative numbers. We're looking not going at, to look at, but these wait, numbers are here, they're in front of you, and I, I, can't, well, I can't see you telling me that you're looking at data or you're looking, you're looking at research now that is actually going to try and help you put these people on the right path for them. That's what's missing. Let's drill down into that sentence, that trans women are women. In order to understand what trans rights activists and gender ideology proponents mean by this, we need to think carefully about the language and the words used. Firstly, let's look at trans. Well, we already know that trans doesn't necessarily mean transsexual or someone who's going through reassignment surgery. We know by Stonewall's own definition that it now includes cross-dressers and drag artists, as well as non-binary people or gender-fluid people who may change their gender whenever they feel like it. It also includes autogynophilic men who derive sexual pleasure from the notion they have a female body. We can take it to mean that these groups have also been included under trans women in this sentence. So what about R? Well, well, initially the slogan trans women are women was meant figuratively to suggest that trans women should be treated as if they were women, so society should change to understand their dysphoria and act accordingly wherever possible, such as using their preferred pronouns through politeness and common courtesy. However, the trans rights activists have now changed this meaning, so the word are now means literally are, trans women literally are women. They were literally women when they were born, and they are literally women now, despite having male genes and genitalia, and many, if not most, not wanting to make any attempt to transition medically. This causes an issue with cross-dressers and drag artists though, as trans women are women suggests that any man who wears makeup or a dress literally becomes a woman through this act alone. 
It causes an even bigger issue with autogynophiles, as the argument suggests that men who are aroused by the idea of being women are actually literally women. Finally, we have the word women itself. So what is a woman? Well, there's two different answers to that question depending on who you ask. Firstly, there's the scientific, biological answer, which is that women are adult human females. If you're born a female, then you're a woman, no matter how you choose to identify. This means that trans women are not women in any biological sense. This is the gender critical argument, and even though some transgender people believe this themselves, the trans rights activists call this belief transphobic. Trans rights activists were very quick to dismiss JK Rowling's essay by claiming that no one is denying biology exists, when actually that's what they've consistently been doing for years. So either the gender ideology activists are being disingenuous, outright lying, or completely unaware of their own movement's message, all of which are very problematic ways for a movement to behave. Secondly, there's the identification answer, which states that anyone who identifies as a woman is a woman, literally. This ignores biology and asks society to change the language around biological sex itself. Whoever feels like a woman is a woman, literally is a woman, whenever and wherever they feel like it. This is self-ID. Excuse me, it's ma'am! It is ma'am! I can call the police if you'd like me to, you need to settle down. You need to settle down and mind your business, okay? Ma'am, once again, ma'am! I said both of you. No, you said sir! Once again, it's ma'am! I actually said both of you guys, it was a general... Right beforehand, you fucking said sir! Sir? Okay. Motherfucker, take it outside! If you want to call me sir again, I will show you a fucking sir! I apologize. Motherfucker! I apologize now. Because you teach this, you teach trans studies, so, so many gender identities that in your view require non-traditional pronouns. Basically, it's not correct that there is such a thing as biological sex, and I'm a historian of medicine, I can unpack that for you at great length if you want, but in the interest of time, uh, I won't. So that's a very popular misconception. It's truly a fascinating, complex um, uh, field of study, but that does not mean that there is no such thing as biological sex. If she were but a student of yours, what would you call her? She. There's something going on that, that, that people really haven't put their finger on and I, I've been thinking about it at multiple levels of analysis and there's one very deep level of analysis that I don't think anyone has addressed and I would think about it as a, as a cognitive level of analysis and it has to do with the nature of categorization itself. What, what happened, what's happening very rapidly is that because the binary category has been, um, let's, call, let's say, violated, that's one way of thinking about it, you get an explosion of chaotic identities, and so it's gone from, say, two to the proposed, I suppose, three, which, which would have been what the formulators of the legislation, I think, were hoping for, to, say, 31 in New York and 70 online. It's a really interesting example of, the, of how, say, binary categories maintain order. And then if you violate them to include those who are excluded, what you produce is an upswelling of, of, of unmanageable chaos. That's the other thing too, is that in the in Bill C-16, there's actually an assault on the concept of reality because identity is technically unmoored from its biological substrate. And so that means it's unmoored from the objective. And as soon as it's unmoored from the objective, then it's subjective and in principle can be anything. But then that, what that seems to do is immediately open the door or has opened the door to I would say an, uh, a philosophical assault on the concept of gender itself with, that culminated, for example, in Dr. Nicholas Matt's um, claim on TVO's The Agenda when he was debating me that there were no biological differences between men and women and that that's what the science over the last four decades has claimed. A remarkable, remarkable claim. Wow, so these people are actually alleging that there are no biological differences between men and women. That is totally crazy and completely counterintuitive. And, and you know, what Peterson also implies in that clip is that by destroying the binary concept of sex and gender, in other words, by assaulting our concepts of what being a man or woman means, specifically by allowing males to identify as women, it actually threatens to destroy the category system itself and hence cause a kind of social chaos. 
and subsequently it leaves the door open to all kinds of other bizarre inversions of reality. And that all seems very dangerous. Well, I've been threatened myself many times because I am somebody who sort of stubbornly insists on reality. Okay, so I'm not a woman. Even if I were to do this on a full-time basis, seven days a week, it still wouldn't make me a woman. Even if I was to have used puberty blockers when I was young and used hormone replacement therapy, I'd still use hormone replacement therapies. I don't want to because I think it's dangerous. But even if I'd done all these things, uh, even if I'd had surgery, it wouldn't change my sex, right? Sex is determined at the chromosomal level, right? And you can't change your chromosomes. So men cannot become women. So because I'm sort of a, a stickler for reality and believe that I have a right to reality, I'm not going to call somebody who's a man uh, a woman um, when they're not. I am firmly on the side of womanhood now, but I am not a woman, nor will I ever be. Three sentences later, I use the women's restroom because I am a woman. I changed my gender, I'm a birth certificate to female because I am a woman. So there's a little confusion there, right? Not for me, what's wrong with that? May I ask you one more question? Definitely. How, how many genders do you believe there are? I really don't know that one. I wish, I wish there, was a, there was a thing, but there's chromosomes, there's cells, there's the fact of you teleporting and once photon teleportation does happen, it's how much of you actually is you and how much of whatever is going on isn't you. It, it's a very complicated thing and it's just a structure that we don't really understand besides X, Y's and where we come from and it's, it's very complicated to even say if we're alive. I mean, I'd never even heard of transgender before the age of 40. I discovered all of this like, amazing science that's, that, that finally made sense. It kind of deconstructs gender, it queers gender. You know, I spent years trying to pass as male. There are some important conflicts of interest here. Trans activists would have you believe that there is absolutely no conflicts of interest here whatsoever. There are no consequences for biological females if we go along with the ideology that they promote, and I disagree. So I think that there are some permissions, protections, resources that if we give them to self-identifying trans women, we will take something away from biological women. And even worse, it will be taking away something that's already in short supply. Um, if same-sex spaces for females, where they undress or where they sleep, are removed or reduced, as is starting to happen across the UK anyway, then this potentially reduces the, sef the safety of females from sexual violence, which was already in short supply. So you can make that sort of point with respect to female sport, uh, media representation, there's a range of areas you could argue that. If trans women are literally women, not just legally, but in every possible context, then, uh, and even more so if self-identifying trans women are literally women in every possible context, then that does nothing less than force society into a complete re-understanding of what it is to be a woman. And obviously that has an impact on the biological females who were already occupying that category. So it's perfectly okay for us to talk about that because it has an impact on our lives. Okay. It poses a deeper question about how a male person, any male person, would have any idea what being female was like. What would be their point of reference? Yes, males can be feminine and women can be masculine, but no person born one sex can truly know what it means to be the other, apart from a vague approximation of what that might feel like. The gender ideology argument falls back on bad science at this point, claiming all manner of spurious facts and data that don't really support their belief in the literality of the trans women are women claim. They often claim sex is a spectrum, which simply isn't true from any biological viewpoint, and that intersex conditions prove this is the case. But to condense a very real, very serious and historically heartbreaking human genetic disorder into one sentence, intersex people are still born either male or female. The genetic or chromosomal disorders they have are variants within each sex, and if anything actively disprove the notion of sex being a spectrum rather than a binary. 
In any case, people with intersex conditions are distinct from the transgender, gay or lesbian communities. Yes, some people born with intersex conditions are gay or lesbians, but that's because they're humans, not specifically because they're intersex. The trans rights activists have another piece of non-scientific rhetoric, which is that people can be born with a female brain in a male body, or vice versa. While there are some scientific differences between male and female brains, mainly in size, there's no evidence of a male brain or a female brain. The psychologist Gina Rippon demonstrates in her book Gender and Our Brains that, looking at over 1400 brain scans, there isn't any difference. In fact, she demonstrates that the differences among women as a group, or among men as a group, are much greater than the differences between men and women. Despite all the robust scientific, biological, philosophical and existentialist evidence that being born in the wrong body is literally impossible, some trans rights activists have argued that their being trans is genetic. However, there would be a perfect case study that would show the theory of being born with trans genes not to be true, and that would be identical twins. Identical twins have identical genes, so taking the activist logic to its end point, if one twin was genetically trans, then the other one should be genetically trans too, they share the same genes. So if we could point to one set of identical twins where one twin was transgender and the other one was not, this, you'd think, would be enough to disprove the genetically trans theory. Unfortunately, with such relatively small numbers of identical twins, and the small number of trans-identifying people in the world, the chances of this occurring are very slim, and so we probably will never find- Oh no wait, here's one. Laverne Cox is a trans woman actor, famous for her role as Sophia in Orange is the New Black, one of the most famous transgender people in the world actually. She was the first transgender person to appear on the cover of Time magazine, so safe to say she's definitely, totally transgender. Her identical twin brother, M. Lamar, however, is not transgender. He's a man. So, case closed on the trans genes theory. Of course, none of this is to say that body or gender dysphoria doesn't exist and isn't real. It does, and it is obviously extremely distressing for any person to feel a mismatch between their gender identity and their sex. This is probably quite common in humans, as gender is a wide and varied spectrum based on psychological, physical and social factors. But unfortunately for anyone suffering dysphoria, biological sex doesn't change in the same way. It isn't a spectrum like gender. People are either male or female, which is hard-coded into the body's genes and DNA. Why do trans rights activists uh, um talk about uh, intersex uh, people? How do, they, how do they use intersex people in this debate? To suggest that biological sex is not a reliable categorization system, I think would best describe the way they use it. So people will say there are, male pe there are males and there are females and you can't change between the two and the gotcha is always what about intersex? That's nice. They think it's a powerful argument because there's a lot of ignorance about what intersex is. So people, um, first of all, back off because if you don't know, you're not going to argue. So you, you mean you mean because it's a because it's a a, a condition that people uh, are a little bit unclear on, they back off uh, when they hear the word because they don't really feel like they uh, know enough to engage. Is that is that what? You yeah, mean? I think it also it plays on stigmas because it plays into the belief that there are people who are not male or female. It's a use of the word, a misunderstanding of the word, that there must be people who are in between. Like, if, a lot of people think that is a thing. Like, I didn't always realise that the word intersex described me until I started looking into it. And then I realised, like, my medical condition falls under that umbrella. So I had the same, like, misconceptions that maybe there were these people in the middle that we didn't, you know, these really super rare people in the middle that we, that we didn't know much about. And, um, and they, they just, they're utilising that ignorance in people, I think. To suggest that there's a third sex? Um, a spectrum of sex is what they say, not a third sex. Right, right. When they say a spectrum of sex, I know there are several intersex conditions that exist uh, along uh, uh, the binary. Um, but they both, they all fall under either male or female, is that right? The idea is to destabilise the concept of biological sex so that they can suggest that gender identity is the way that society should be organised. Right. I think that's the, the idea behind it. Because it's quite complicated because there are also some trans people um, 
sometimes will believe that they might be intersex because they think that might explain why they feel the way they do. Yes. So there's, there's that. There's what, so sometimes it's brought in like that way as well. Yeah. So what? So exactly, how does one know if one's intersex or not? Uh, you are diagnosed with a DSD by a doctor. <laughs> right, right, okay. So, but do you think there's a lot of self-diagnosis going on with people deciding that they're intersex? Um, yeah, it's, it's actually a really, a really big problem. Um, if you look at, like the, the UK government did a survey, an LGBTI survey, it was the first time they tried to include the I. And in their results, they said that, that it was evident that there were people using the word in a non-medical sense. And so, therefore, they were not, they were not the intersex people they were looking for. Um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and and, and that the data then was meaningless because there were obviously people who weren't intersex answering on behalf of intersex people. Because they're medical conditions that involve the genitals, people have like a, a weird fascination. Mm. So um, there's a history of people pretending to be intersex going, going back years and years and years. Um, and there are, there's been papers written about it and it's especially a problem online that there are people who will uh, they and they make up these like fantastical right they're not they won't claim to have an actual dsd they will make up some like bizarre um like combination of uh, sex characteristics so like they were born with like you know like two penises and like three uteruses and like were able to self-pregnate themselves and like just really like mad fantastical stories clear something up you're a biological female i've heard Biologi it I've... biological male okay like intersex oh, intersex and and and, and 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 that's and that's a big thing that they just do not want to believe it they don't want to understand they don't want to they don't want to really they don't want to believe it because so they you... know it's going to be against them so do oh. you have you have male genitalia and female genitalia? Yeah. Exactly. Do you have a do you have a scrotum and a penis? Exactly. Are you are you circumcised? Yeah. <laughs> are you, are both parts circumcised? Yes. Oh wow, nice. Again, because people believe it must be true. So these stories get amplified, especially the more extraordinary stories because they're, you know, ghoulishly fascinating. Um so you end up with people who are pretending to have something that doesn't exist <laughs> becoming the spokespeople for those of us with actual medical conditions and needs wow wow yeah Let's take a minute to look closer at self-ID. As we know, the trans activists state that anyone who identifies as a woman is a woman, literally. And they're pushing for reforms to the Gender Recognition Act to make this the law. How this impacts on women's rights is the main concern and driving force of the gender critical movement. Women have fought for many years for equality and safe spaces segregated along the lines of sex. This includes female-only domestic violence refuges, rape shelters, hospital wards, changing rooms, groups and organisations and other places where women can be away from men. There are valid reasons for this as men are much more likely to commit violence than women, committing 98% of all recorded sexual offences for example. Women are rightfully worried about men entering these safe spaces or taking female-only jobs such as support workers or care assistants dealing with vulnerable women. This is not to suggest in any way that trans women are inherently violent, but it is to state that they are no less violent than other males. Another impact is on women's equality. If men can now claim to be women just by self-identification alone, then corporate boards made up entirely of men can claim that half of them now identify as women and the gender pay gap almost immediately disappears without any female representation on the board at all. Now that's obviously an extreme and slightly silly example and unlikely to happen, but there are other examples that show this just as clearly that are actually happening right now. For example, police in the UK record crime statistics as occurring according to the gender to which the perpetrator claims to identify. This means that a man committing a crime can claim to be a woman and the crime is recorded as being committed by a woman, or vice versa. Seeing as we know that most crime is committed by men, it seems that recording crime rates using these figures will do nothing but skew any official statistics completely. This is borne out by the fact that the number of women and girls being incarcerated are growing at a much faster rate than at any time in recorded history. But how can we tell if that's truly the case or not if we don't know the sex of the offenders? 
Particularly worrying is that the statistics on sexual offences committed by women now include men who self-identify as women. This has meant that the number of women committing child sexual offences has skyrocketed massively. Recent examples of this include cases such as the trans woman Julie Marshall, caught with over 80,000 images of child sexual abuse after accessing it from her hospital bed in a women's ward. Anthony Scales, a trans woman convicted of possession of over 1,500 images of child sexual abuse, who blamed his crimes on his gender dysphoria. And Leah Harvey, a trans woman who was convicted of five counts of attempting to incite a young girl to engage in sexual activity, who reportedly bragged about being a paedophile. These three were listed in official records as being women. Again, this isn't to suggest in any way that trans women are inherently likely to commit such offences, but it is to state that they are no less likely to commit them as other males. Anthony Prince, or Tony Prince, this man was convicted of possession of nearly 1,200 indecent images of children, including over 100 Category A images which show children being raped. Court proceedings referred to this man using she and her. Media reports described him as a woman, used the name Tony and female pronouns to refer to him. Duncan Smart, who calls himself Jacinta Brooks. This man was convicted of three counts of inciting a child to engage in sexual activity and three counts of possessing indecent images. Media reports referred to this man as Jacinta and used she and her. These are not our crimes. Christopher Wharton, who prefers to call himself Zoe Lines. This man was convicted of breaching a sexual harm prevention order. He has a previous conviction for raping a girl. Court proceedings referred to him using female pronouns, as did media reports, which also referred to him using the name Zoe Lines. And we had this one case where this, this transgender person was in the rape shelter and was basically uh, molesting uh, women that were in the rape shelter. So this is like the kind of insanity that you get. And it's all about self-identity, right? Uh, the newspapers after the fact uh, tried to say that, oh, well, this person wasn't really transgender. They were just pretending to be transgender. Nobody is a fake transgender. Anybody who says they are transgender is transgender. The law doesn't get that nitty gritty. I mean, there's no uh, central bureau to issue certificates of being transgender. If you say you're transgender, and present as transgender, you are transgender. So this person who, this man who went into the women's rape shelter, he was transgender. I mean, just because he committed a crime, you can't say after the fact, well, he wasn't really transgender. He was, because he said he was. This, in turn, leads to the issue of self-identification in prisons, too. Women make up just 7% of the prison population, and in general terms, serve shorter sentences due to the different nature of their crimes. There have been very real and horrifying examples of male prisoners claiming to be trans in order to be moved into women's prisons. Most famously, Karen White, who was on remand for sexual offences committed as a man against women. White was moved to a women's prison after claiming to identify as a woman and went on to sexually assault female inmates before being transferred back to a male prison. And her transgender status was eagerly supported by Jamila Jamil. Now, 1 in 50 male offenders in prison are self-identifying as transgender, according to Peter Clark, the Chief Inspector of Prisons in the UK. This leads us to the trans prisoner paradox. Trans rights activists are incredibly firm in their suggestion that self-ID does not pose any risk, and is not open to abuse in this way, and they believe that anyone who self-identifies as a woman, is a woman. Now, if that's true, how do they account for the fact that the transgender community is so massively overrepresented in the prison population? If 1 in 50 inmates are transgender, this would make the transgender community one of the most dangerous groups in the UK, with 1 in every 200 transgender people incarcerated, as opposed to 1 in every 1000 for the general population. Obviously, only one of these things can be true. Either self-ID can be and is being abused by prisoners, or the trans community has within it an overwhelming problem, with transgender people more than five times likely to go to prison for committing crimes. Given that no trans rights activist is willing to concede either point, it means they believe in this bizarre paradox that ignores evidence and basic logic. 
Labour MP Lisa Nandy was also more than prepared to state that male paedophiles identifying as trans women should be housed in female prisons, despite being aware of these risks, claiming that anyone opposing this idea is simply being transphobic. Given um, the growing number of sex offenders, such as someone like Christopher Wharton, who is um, a male sex offender, who's a, he's a child rapist, who was convicted last year of which you called, who was already convicted of being of multiple child rape, who is now claiming to be a woman. Given that we know there's a growing number of these men, I've got three questions. Should his crimes be recorded, as he would wish, as being committed by a woman? Should be should he be accommodated in a women's or a men's prison? Prison, and should women in the Labour Party be seen as a hate group if we raise questions like this? So I'm going to I'm just going to take them in order if that's all right, and I'll start with this question about the Gender Recognition Act because um, and I'm, excuse me for taking a bit of time over this, but I want to treat it with care because I think it deserves careful language and most of all a bit more light and a bit less heat than we've managed to have in this debate so far. The questions that you asked were about whether cri the, the crimes of a particular person should be recorded as by a woman or a man. And I, I, believe, I believe fundamentally in people's right to self-ID. And I believe that the Gender Recognition Act strikes the wrong balance in relation to that. So I think that crimes that are recorded should be recorded as that person wishes, having gone through that process, received support um, and self-identified. Um, you asked about whether people, trans people should be in women's or men's prisons. Well, I think trans women are women and I think trans men are men. So I think that they should be in the prisons of their choosing. Um, and do, you, do I think that women in the Labour Party who raise questions about this should be expelled? No, I don't. I, why, I do think that that, that, why did you sign the pledge? Why did you sign the pledge? I'll explain. About Women's Place UK. I'll, I'll, I'll explain. explain. Why did you sign the pledge? So women are honoured for over two hours of trans activists bashing on the windows of when Women's Place UK had a meeting. Why did none of you speak out about that? If, you're, if you wanted to take the heat and what, have more light in the debate. Genuinely, did, did you didn't You didn't know, but it was talked about at a conference. But, but I'm happy to talk to you about it. I mean, you know, look, this is a, this is a... I can see a real danger here where people are in a male prison for sexual offences, including rape, and they basically go, hey, I, I'm a woman, which gets them out of a male prison where they might be having a rough time anyway, and gets them into a prison full of women who are their primary target. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the main issue, really, with self-identification, which is the new law that potentially could be coming through Parliament. I mean, at the moment, there is a safeguard where um, a transgender person will have to prove that they're transgender by at least living for two years, say, as a woman, um, and having a doctor's diagnosis. The study that I've, I've just done recently is looking at how many prisoners there are um, and how many are in male prisons, how many in female prisons. Um, and I've found about 13 in female prisons already, but there are a hundred in male prisons living as women, um, but they will immediately be able to transfer into okay. female so, prisons when... So well, hang on, there's, yeah. there's a couple of examples here. A transgender rapist who was moved to a women-only jail, despite still having yeah. uh, male genitalia, uh, was segregated after making unwanted sexual advances on female inmates. Um, we have a, a male transgender prisoner guilty of a brutal murder moved from a women's jail because he kept having intercourse with female inmates. Um, there are, it seems, examples of where people are being moved and then pose a threat, this is the point, isn't it? Pose yep. a threat exactly. to the women in prison. Yep. Um, Already it's possible to do that, but it will only ever get worse when it becomes easier for, for people to transfer. And just explain then this law that is yeah. going through Parliament, because your, your organisation is all about having a look at how this um, impacts women, exactly. isn't it? Yeah. So we're against um, the self-identification of gender, which is the new law that is being mm. proposed to go through. So there's a consultation at the moment. 
Um, so you don't want people just to be able to tick a box exactly. so saying at, at I the am moment, now a woman? At the moment okay. to get a gender recognition certificate you need to have lived as a woman for two years and have a doctor's diagnosis. Yes. So I've got great concerns myself that this law is called the Gender Recognition Act. It is due reform and there are important things that do need to be changed but even as a transgender person and I have to say that I am probably in the minority with, with this view. I, I share some of the concerns that the other speaker this morning has but we should remember that transgender women are women they're not men but it comes down to that genuine aspect are you happy for anyone born to a male biological body to simply raise their hand without any need for surgery and to compete in the olympics against women born to female biological bodies so i'm a huge fan of athletics and this has been a really big raging debate because particularly around the issue of caster semenya mm. and so i've been following it really closely but hang on caster semenya is th that's a different case different case no, yeah, yeah, but, 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 that, but that caster semenya is not a trans is that right? no no there's, a, no there's an argument about whether caster semenya is a man or a woman we're different. talking that's about people self-identifying sure. with male biological bodies saying i am female I'm now competing against sure. women born to female biological bodies. But, That's the debate. But, but the Should any man or anyone born to a male biological body be able to self-identify as a woman without any surgery uh, or any of that transition process and compete in professional sport against women born to female biological bodies? Well, That's the nub of the debate. Yeah, that, that is the nub of the debate. If Floyd Mayweather uh, spent a year taking testosterone treatment and then uh, compete in uh, female boxing. Are you happy for them to then compete against women born to female biological bodies? Well, the point I was trying to make before you cut me off was that I think there has to be a commission set up in sport to decide what the parameters are of those sporting rules. I mean, these are rules that are set by sporting bodies. It's not fair, is it? By it's governing it's bodies. It's just not sport. fair. You don't need a commission to work out. It wouldn't be right for Floyd Mayweather to identify as female and then fight women boxers born to female biological bodies. It's not a commission issue, it's a common sense issue, isn't it? No, I don't... You're I... about to be potentially leader of the Labour Party, and you say that this is something that doesn't really matter, and I'm... I think it does matter. I think these things... No, I, think, I, think I think it does they, matter. I think it I think is, a, it is there's crushing women's rights. There's a basic women's inherent rights. question of how you treat people properly in this country. That Usain Bolt could self-identify as female and, and compete against women born to female biological bodies. Because body. you why are can't doing you just say, because like, I'll it, tell you why. Clear, you're I'll normal tell you person, why. Lisa. We'll just go, I'll just tell you madness. why. Because you are doing what too many people have done in this in this well, debate. asking a straight question. No, you've created more heat and less light. You're setting no, up an example no, no, that is just simply no, nonsense. No, absolute nonsense. It's a straw man. I've asked, there are two uh, trans athletes who were competing as male athletes, born to male biological bodies, tall, powerful, very fast. They are now identifying as female and they're smashing all Connecticut women's records. I don't think that is fair to women's rights. Right. This is a proper issue about how far do trans rights override women's rights. And I think that your inability to give me a straight answer I am giving is you your a straight problem, answer. not mine. I am giving you a straight answer, Piers. I'm saying that you're not. Is, uh, no, I'm saying that you are setting up a straw man in this. What about the weightlifter in New Zealand who is wanting to compete in the Olympics as a female weightlifter who previously competed as a male weightlifter born with a male biological body? Is that right? But that's why I said to you we need to set up a commission to consider these issues. Probably. You won't have a commission in time for the Olympics. They're in three months. Yeah, but th this is why sport needs to get together but and sort this out. Is it fair, Lisa? Out. Well, it's 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 why not fair if me? there are no rules. What you're not doing is giving a straight. Answer. I am giving a straight. You're answer. not. No, you're I am giving to, a straight You're trying answer. to actually do everything but give a straight answer. No, I'm sorry. Because I'm you're not. worried about the reaction I'm your answer not. will cause you. No. What am I doing that's... but trying to defend women's rights? To from a grotesquely unfair situation where people born to male biological bodies who have an obvious superior strength and power are now being able to simply say I'm female and compete against women born to female bodies. What am I doing that's so wrong? You are attacking some of the most marginalised people am I attacking? in this country. I've Take always supported transgender rights. I'm not attacking anybody. Yes, you are. I'm defending exactly women's... No, I'm defending women's rights. Well, that would be a first, to be honest. It wouldn't, actually. And, and I defend I... women's rights a lot on this programme. 
I'm sorry, I think this is just outrageous. I ask him a question about whether they should compete in sport. We need far less heat, far more light, and you've just shown exactly why over the last few minutes. Wow! Is that what you really think? Yes, that is exactly. Do you what really I'm think thinking. viewers watching this think I've been attacking transgender people? Yeah, I do. Really? Yeah, I do. I bet you not one of them thinks that. You said it was grotesque. No, I said it's grotesquely unfair to women if transgender athletes born to male biological bodies with superior strength and power are able to compete against them in female competition as, say, weightlifters or boxers. But that's why you need some proper rules around Why can't you just give me a straight answer sport. and agree well, that's, that's unfair? Said. No, okay. I said you need rules. All right. Anyone who's ever questioned any aspect of the gender ideology out loud on social media or in real life is immediately called a bigot, a transphobe, or accused of wanting trans people erased from the world. Despite the overblown rhetoric, this is problematic behaviour in several different ways, and known as bigoteering. Firstly, it's manipulation, pure and simple. It's an attempt to silence people by exploiting the social stigmas around transphobia and bigotry, with the accuser attempting to gain the upper hand in terms of virtuous behaviour, forcing those accused to spend time and energy to explain why they're not a bigot or a transphobe. It's also intellectually lazy, as trans rights activists use it to end any debate or discussion they know they cannot answer adequately. Calling someone a bigot or a transphobe and then refusing to continue a conversation is isn't the greatest way to win friends and influence people, and shows the insecurity they have in their own position. It means that trans rights activists don't have to understand or deal with the nature of the problem they're causing. But most importantly, it dilutes actual transphobia and bigotry. This is a huge issue, as there are genuinely hateful, transphobic people in the world spreading vile abuse towards trans people. By calling everything else bigoted or transphobic, the true victims of hatred are the ones being insulted. It almost gives a free pass to those who are actually transphobic too, who can then hide behind the excuse, well, everything is transphobic these days. There are perhaps a few reasons why gender ideology has grown so quickly as a movement, and why trans rights activists have so much support. One is what we call the sneak. The fact that trans rights is a term in itself, and that supporters of the ideology call themselves activists, might suggest that the ideology is a good thing. After all, activists and people fighting for their rights have historically been seen as well-meaning and virtuous, but this isn't really the case here. The claim that gender ideology is a civil rights issue has painted the movement to be something it is not. Gender ideology and queer theory have piggybacked on a lot of the LGB rights movement, as we've discussed. Stonewall, for example, has moved from an LGB rights organisation to one that is more distinctly trans, as can be seen clearly by the comparison of the words lesbians and trans in their literature over time. The sneak is the phrasing and naming of the movement as a rights issue, when it appears to be much more complex and political. The same can be said to some extent of the Black Lives Matter movement. Not the sentiment itself, obviously, which is unarguable, as of course black lives do matter greatly, but the organisation behind the movement, which among other things has been accused of anti-Semitism for their pro-Palestinian and anti-Israeli stance, a stance which seems more suited to the Lebanese civil war than a movement about police brutality against black people in America and other countries. But because anyone who says, I don't agree with Black Lives Matter, meaning the organisation rather than the sentiment, will be accused of racism, the organisation looks to the outside world as a just, virtuous and well-meaning civil rights group, rather than an authoritarian left political group. If you don't think this is the case, look at the treatment of black people who disagree with the Black Lives Matter movement's stance. They face being criticised and abused by the most vocal BLM activists, many of whom are not black. No, no way! You know... You're not black on the inside! I'm more black than you on the inside at this particular point! Yeah. Oh, I like black! There were people during the times of slavery who enabled the slavers. We've reached a situation where a white person can abuse a black person under the guise of a pro-black civil rights movement, and the white person will receive support. The same is identically true of the trans rights movement. Anyone expressing disagreement with the trans rights activists, no matter how abusive they may be, will be called transphobic, accused of wanting trans people dead, face having their personal details revealed, lose their jobs or be violently attacked in real life, again all under the guise of a well-meaning civil rights movement. This means that gender critical trans people, such as Debbie Hayton, Miranda Yardley, Buck Angel and others, have all been targeted. This has meant that trans people have been abused by non-trans men 
under the banner of pro-trans civil rights, and all of this is supported and cheered on by celebrities, politicians, political activists and others. We're really through the looking glass in terms of how a society should behave. Yeah, normally you engage with arguments, you don't talk about character or motivations, you don't try and say that somebody's evil or, you know, all that. Plus, there have been public protests about me on campus, at the student union, there's been stuff in the Argus about me, so it's all coming down. And the aim is to make me feel ashamed, as far as I can see, and, that, and, and also to socially isolate me from potential supporters so that they don't get dragged into this media frenzy, whatever. And the ultimate aim is to get me to stop talking. Um, so generalizing from my own case, Social shaming seems to me the way that operates in this debate. You're told you're evil, you're told you're confused, you don't know enough, you're not kind, um, you're causing harm. And that's meant to get us to shut up. And it's particularly aimed at females because we are <laughs> susceptible, allegedly, to this feeling of shame. So people will use this more disproportionately on females than males. But in my case, it hasn't worked. <laughs> <laughs> So how can we sort this out? Is it possible? I don't think we can bring the United Nations in to keep the peace, and we certainly shouldn't be expecting Syrian intervention, so it's likely that this debate will rumble on for some time. Perhaps the most important thing is for people, everyone, to use their voices. Keep talking about the issues, showing reason, evidence and logic, rather than just giving out abuse or sloganeering. Those celebrities and MPs who are caught up in the gender ideology, supporting trans rights activists and refusing to specifically condemn their abuse, will soon find themselves having to justify their behaviour and beliefs, and most won't be able to. The gender critical movement, as ragtag and loosely connected as it is, needs to remain focused on pointing the spotlight onto the various disingenuous claims, violent abusive behaviour and misogyny that appears at the core of the gender ideology movement and its activists. Keep calling it out, keep speaking up, but also Call out true transphobia and hatred towards trans people when you see it. Above all else, keeping anyone genuinely suffering from gender dysphoria safe from real transphobia is essential. There will be unwarranted backlash against them at some point, brought about by the violent and abusive trans rights activists themselves. This is clear, as support for LGBT rights has fallen for the first time in history. It's vitally important to protect vulnerable people. If there's one thing we can learn from history, it's that while two sides are in conflict, it's very easy for an external group to come in and take over, and for innocent people to have to deal with the consequences. I think there's going to be a huge swing back, don't you? I mean, it's gone, it's so authoritarian and so divorced from what people actually think and want. You know? It yeah. gets to the point that even people who are like, yeah, you know, okay, trans women are women, I don't know why, but fine, that's what I'm meant to say now. Uh, those people are like, no, but hang on, <laughs> really? This six foot eight person is meant to be, you know, beating the shit out of these women in this game? No, that can't be right, you know? Like, it, so, and, then, and then we unfortunately will have a big swing back. Mm. And I don't oh. want a big swing back, but we will. Okay. So how do we afford a tolerant um, uh, swing back or tolerant pu pushback? How, when you've got you mad precipitate? people promoting okay. mad things? I mean, it's not me that's making there be a big swing back. It's people who are promoting insanity. Okay. Like, I wish they wouldn't. I mean, I've got people I care about who are not, you know, um, gender conforming, whatever. You know, I'm not blooming very gender conforming myself. But, you know, I don't, mm. everybody's going to get caught up on this. It's like these wretched people who are trying to get, you know, furries into gay parades. It's like... Oh, come on. Do we have to have the pups and the, the furries and the other kin and so on? Just making all gay people look like complete fart perverts, which was exactly what we were trying not to do. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's completely mm -hmm. mad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't know the answer. But I mean, this is this is the, the pendulum swing is going to come. OK, this whole gender debate to me mm -hmm. has got completely out of control. Imagine being India Willoughby, Willoughby who has gone through mm. transitioning, which is an extraordinarily difficult emotional, psychological, and physical process. 
lasting a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And then when you finally get to transition to be a woman, right? Then you get told, actually, it's meaningless because there are now a hundred ways no. to identify gender. Well, let's That's hear from my India. Most trans people, and I'm actually going to use the word transitioners here because transgender now has become something completely different. Transgender now is about floating about in the middle, no commitment, you pick and choose who you want to be. And if you're saying that you know, this is making a mockery of gender. Well, what, what's your views on drag? I find drag far more offensive than anything that Pia I mean, says. Drag, drag is gay. No, but drag is gay men dressing up as women in a flamboyant way, exaggerated man and, mannerisms. And drag They're is a beautiful gender. Art. No, it's not India, a beautiful India, do you not art accept? Whatsoever. It is, it is. That's a ridiculous it's comment. Not. You identify as a, as you are, you are a trans woman. A no, I, I no longer, do you know what? I no longer identify as trans because okay. it's become so so embarrassing because of people like you and what you champion. Oh, India. I'm ashamed of it. You it's must awful. Accept. Get away from this this ridiculous control freakery stuff yeah. that no one's allowed to challenge it. If it's to me that says that, I'm going to say it. And you're not going to stop me and you're not going to get me fired. Because actually, I'm not intensely keen on this cancelled culture. What would be You better... signed the petition to have me fired. I, I did because you don't seem to want to learn. You want to fire me because you want me to think what how you think. What most people on Twitter and do my problem well. about liberals today is they become so illiberal they're only interested in making other people agree with them and think like them and if they don't they no platform them they ban them they cancel them they sign petitions to get people fired and it is utter nonsense okay you're damaged i'm telling you you <laughs> have damaged damage. okay your ideology has actually damaged my career I mean, over the last many few years because you people disagree turned with the you whole India. thing into a joke i've lost work because of what it's become people don't want to get involved with transgender no. people that's because, because no, it's you're, you're, not you're, not you're, you're, you're not listening it, you? you don't you want to hear this is accept, real life I don't experience. That, Everyone who thinks a hundred genders yeah. is nonsense is bigoted. Well, the problem is, is that, that your position. I think a great many of them have broader bigotry. No, no, lead uh, to this position. If you, we now hear the Brit Awards has to go awards neutral, almost Crazy. certainly as a result of Sam Smith. So because of one guy yeah, who now person. says I can't decide if I'm male or female, we no longer have best male or female yeah. categories. You know who will suffer in that? Women. So I can be a Chinese woman. <laughs> um, sure. But I can't be a six foot five Chinese woman. Yes. It shouldn't be hard to tell a five nine white guy that he's not a six foot five Chinese woman. But clearly it is. Why? What does that say about our culture? And what does that say about our ability to answer the questions that actually are difficult? Wow. I mean, that is absolutely crazy. So just using political correctness, we've resulted in kids who can't think critically and reason critically, or perhaps they're afraid to do so because of how that might make them look. Um, they'll be, you know, thought of as bigots or whatever, so they just go along with anything. And when you start doing that with kids in kindergarten and doing it all the way through their school, what you're going to end up with are some very uh, severely controlled youths that are afraid to think critically and will just do whatever they're told to do uh, or agree with whatever they're told to agree with. So this is very insidious from a free speech perspective. This, this has been a particularly weird experience to live through, I think, the whole gender thing, because it is so weird. Like, it's just so weird. It's so religious, so culty, so unattached to anything real you know mm -hmm. and it is so insane i think it's the thing that's making pendulum swing a long way and then swing back mm -hmm. i don't know i don't maybe maybe america is crazy benjamin maybe that's the problem well yeah but you guys are you know kind of following along yeah we're following yeah, yeah but i don't know okay. that we would have thought of it ourselves i don't think we're a, fact <laughs> a factory for such a level of madness you know what do you think of jk rowling's position on trans women i don't agree with it why because um, I think trans women are women and trans men are men. Do you think that um, trans women who haven't undergone surgery should be allowed um, in women's toilets, for example? Yes. You do? Yeah. I, I believe, and, listen, and you're happy uh, the, the, for trans the, the, women, the, the, the pre, -op, pre -op trans women in women's prisons as well. Yeah. And that's why I'm afraid I disagree with J.K. Rowling. What about the women who um, do not think that this is right, that they feel threatened, their, their space feels threatened by the presence of a man in a woman's loo with a penis? I don't agree with them.
up take care of yourselves and uh, keep fighting if you've watched to the end of this video we'd just like to say thank you very much we really do appreciate it these videos take a fair bit of time to write and produce so please feel free to donate to the state media at coffee.com slash the state media. If you enjoyed this video, please click the like button and subscribe to keep up to date with any new content. If you didn't like this video, why not put queer theory to the test and expand the bandwidth of what it means to dislike something by clicking like and subscribe anyway. You can visit our website at thestatemedia.com for more content. We'll see you next time.